This is the best, the best. Do you hear me? Of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. And we welcome you to Tuesday. Glad you're here. A lot going on. Quite a bit going on. And uh, we begin by saying hello to you. A number of guests as well, including a live report from the White House. We are uh, hoping to bring you live coverage of the Alabama football team at the White House uh, visiting President Trump. Unfortunately, it looks like Mark Zuckerberg has uh, hijacked every available satellite in the uh, city of Washington, but we'll try to effort and get that on as quickly as possible. But that's where we begin on this Tuesday. Once again, there he is. Nick Saban knows the way to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, making his sixth appearance there as, uh, as the national championship coach. Visiting uh, President Trump for the first time. He has visited with Obama four times. President George W. Bush once, and now President Trump. In other news, Ole Miss has formally objected to Michigan transfer Shea Patterson's waiver appeal. More on that as we go throughout the program. But again, I uh, fully expected to look up. We have a bank of televisions here, all the major networks, all the cable networks, including the sports channels. And I thought I would see Nick Saban across the board. But I am told by Mark uh, that uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the uh, head of Facebook, is uh, testifying right now in front of the Senate. And uh, I don't know why. Would any why would anyone think Mark Zuckerberg is only worth about two hundred billion dollars and runs Facebook would be more important? than Nick Saban. I do not understand that. Nick Saban's not being called to testify in front of Congress, so he's good. Big show on tap. Daniel Carlson needs no introduction to this audience. He is the great Auburn kicker and uh, about to find out what he will be doing the next few years in the NFL. We'll talk to him in a short time. Philip Stutz, our political guru, live at the White House. He grew up in Alabama, an Alabama fan, now lives in D.C. He's at the Trump Palace giving us the latest. And Barrett Salee, probably never been to the White House. Based on his writings lately, probably never will go. But he'll be here this afternoon. And your phone calls at 855-242-7285, 855-242-7285. Love to hear from you. Give us a ring, and let's start with Matt in Texas. Matt, welcome to our program. Matt, tell me this. How many years from will it be that Jimbo Fisher, who has never been to the White House as a head coach, he's the only, okay. he's the only head coach in recent memory whose team did not get to the White House when he was the head coach at Florida State? All right. When will he be at the White House as the head coach of the national champion Texas A&M Aggies? I'll give him probably 2019 or 2020. He will be at the White House, Paul. Okay. And I, wanted, and I wanted to talk to you about something today, Paul. Okay, okay, Matt. I want to talk about the upcoming spring games and what has to do with Texas A&M. I think this team, I know a lot of people have been saying that this team's going to go 8-4, and four, and I'm not... I'm not going to disagree, but I partly disagree on that. I think this team has the potential to be more of an 8-4 and four team this year. And the reason why I'm saying that, Paul, is because if can, they can just get some stuff straightened out, like stopping the run, like they had trouble last year, when people just kept on running the ball down their throat. If they can get that straightened out with Jimbo Fisher, which I know he will get that straightened out, with a defensive coordinator he hired from Notre Dame, I just think this team has the potential to be more than an eight and four football team, and if they can beat Clemson, that'll give them some momentum to maybe get that ten and two season. Jimbo Fisher, Kevin, his first year. Listen, you may be right. I don't know. Uh, I'm pretty. I'm, I'm upbeat long term on the Aggies, Matt. This year is a little bit hard to say. Thank you for the call, cheerleader. Oh, hello again. Hello again. What's up, cheerleader? Uh, when I don't talk to you on the radio, I can't tell you how many of my friends want to know why I haven't talked on the radio, so i got to start calling more. 
I well, you're you. right. I don't want anybody to think we've broken up, cheerleader. Absolutely not. Don't tell my husband, for the gosh sake. No, I wouldn't my dare. My husband was so fine. Oh, it was so good. And I'm glad the weather really did turn out a little bit better than all, all was predicted. But there's not a more serene, civilized site than Augusta National is this. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and you know the the clouds, even they they appear to be civilized, whereas we can't say that much about anybody else in the United States anymore. Oh my gosh! Let me ask you this question: How many uh, changing the subject? How many do you think are going to show up for all these spring games this year? It entirely depends on the weather, cheerleader. Uh, Auburn did not have a great crowd Saturday because the weather was terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think of Alabama. I mean, Alabama has gone anywhere between 70 and 95,000. So it yeah. uh, depends on uh, yeah. what kind of day we get. And, and let me ask you this. I can't remember if you pay $5 or something to get into the spring games or if it's open, to, open for free. I don't, I don't know. I don't either. I don't, I don't know that. But you doing good? I am doing great, cheerleader. And listen, uh, Nick Saban is more important than uh, the fella up there than Mark. Nick is more important. Don't well, he's got, well, well you know, the, pre- the president only has a four-year term. I mean, Saban's there for life. So, uh, yeah, uh, no go. doubt. Hey, and thank you for the call. Brandon, uh, Brandon is up next. Uh, Brandon, welcome to the show. Hey, what's going on, Ms. Paul? How you doing? We're doing great. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to touch briefly on this Johnny Manziel thing. I know it's all over the headlines. I mean, we're not even back in pro football. We don't even have a professional career, and we're already starting our own brand name to come back. I want to discuss that with you. I think it's a little bit – it's just absurd. And I just – I don't I, – I can't really figure out – I want to get your input on Johnny Manziel. I mean, in my opinion, his career is over. It's been over. And I want to get your, you know, your take on some of that for a minute. Yeah, you know, listen, I'm a contrarian here, but I, I try to speak the truth. Uh, I, I don't believe he'll ever make it back to the NFL. Uh, I think he is bad news, and, and I know he's trying to make a comeback, but uh, it takes more than uh, mere words. But, but in the end, I think he'll knock around spring league, minor leagues, and I, I think the odds of him going – why, why would an NFL club take a chance on Johnny Manziel? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, he, 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 he's been poisoned. He continues to be poisoned. He, all he is is a locker room disruption. That's it. Plain and simple. Well, and, until, uh, yeah, I mean, until he proves that he's not. Uh, and, and, you know, when Johnny Manziel can go someplace and be a teammate versus a carnival act, then, then I think people will have more faith in him. Uh, Richard is in Shreveport. You're on the air. Go right ahead, Richard. Uh, yes, uh, Paul. Good to talk to you. Look. Uh, a while back, they were talking about the uh, hitting the quarterback rule as far as you know, him being in the pocket. Uh, my thought uh, he, the, the quarterback should be protected while he is in in the pocket. Once he tucks that ball and gets out of the pocket, he's not a quarterback anymore. He's a, he's a ball carrier. He's a runner. And the, the same rules required. You know, for the hitting the runner with to hand in. So, I mean, there was a big talk about his protecting up. When he's a runner, he's a runner. Good point. Hey, listen, thank you very much. Uh, we have a lot to do on the program today, including uh, several visits to the White House. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. We welcome you back. We'll head back to the White House so when the president comes down. And we understand that the president uh, having a private meeting with Nick Saban, probably trying to offer Saban the chief of staff's job or something. Uh, anyway, uh, welcome back to the program. We'll hit to some calls, and then we'll go back to the White House when there is something to see. Johnson, uh, John, is, John is next in Johnson City, Tennessee. Hey, I have been watching and listening to the show, and I have now decided how to handle Jim from Tuscaloosa. And please help me. Please. What, what do you, you we need, need to, to do? You need to push the mute button, or if you video or DVD'd it, 
you push the fast forward, and the show continues, and you don't have to put up with his crap. That's my suggestion. John, I take it you don't like Jim. Well, I, I, Jim's probably very knowledgeable on that, but, you know, he runs that mouth, and it's all about him. It's not about the show and knowledge and stuff. No, I don't care for Jim. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, again, that's part of what makes a show, but he's ridiculous at times. So I just push the mute button and go on to the next time. I keep watching and taking care of things. Okay, well, listen, so, I appreciate the advice. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. You have a good day. And don't mess around. And you don't mess around with Jim either. Uh, Joe is up next. Hey, good afternoon, Paul. How y'all doing today? Okay. Well, that was some good information right there because I've never it never crossed my mind to just mute it when Jim's on. But that was a, actually a good idea that I'll. I tell you what, Joe. Hold on, just a second. We need to head to the wash uh, to the White House. I apologize for interrupting, but uh, we have some activity going on at sixteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue. So let's go right there. The President of the United States, accompanied by Coach Nick Saban. Great job. They're big guys back there, huh? Well, thank you very much, and it's my great honor to welcome the college football national champions to the White House, the University of Alabama Crimson Tide. Congratulations. Congratulations. To the university president, Stuart Bell, athletic director, Greg Byrne, coach Nick Saban, and the extraordinary group of players, and they are extraordinary, and they're going to be very rich. They're going to be very rich. <laughs> Gathered here, congratulations on your incredible victory. It was truly a win for the ages. I don't know if you know, but I was there. I was there. I, I got to see it. Each of you here today is here because of your grit, your drive, your dedication, and your incredible teamwork. You all worked together, inspired each other, had each other's backs, and drove yourselves onward to one of the greatest victories ever. You carry on a storied tradition of Alabama football excellence. It really is excellence. Coach, you'll have to explain that. You could sell that secret, make a lot of money. You know that. You could only sell it. Over the last several decades, America learned, it's really, in a very big way, learned that Alabama football knows how to win and how to keep winning. They just keep winning. It also takes a great coach and a great athletic director and all of the other ingredients. But you've now claimed 26 SEC championships and 17 national championships. Five of your national championships were won under Coach Saban. Was it five or six? Six? I thought it was six. It's going to be six, right? And one at LSU. That's right. So you have six all together, huh? Wow. They shouldn't have let you go, Coach. And they're thinking about that, too. Including this year's national championship, which will go down as one of the most exciting finishes in college football history of any sport. Anyone who wants to know how Alabama does it should study Coach Saban's simple philosophy. It's called the process. Coach tells his players, don't look at the scoreboard. Don't look at any external factors. Just focus all your efforts, all your toughness, and all your discipline on executing each play, one play at a time. And by doing that, by focusing on the process, the outcome winning will take care of itself. It's great philosophy. 
in the national championship game, you stuck to the process, even when it was looking pretty tough. I was watching. I said, Coach, not looking too good. Down 13 to nothing at halftime to a great Georgia team. These champions fought back as they did all season long, and they kept fighting and fighting. Jalen Hurts displayed amazing poise and leadership. Where's Jalen? Where's Jalen? Great, great job. That was poise. Calvin Ridley towards defenses all year, becoming the only second receiver. And you're the only one in Alabama history to compile over 200 receptions for a career. 200. Where's Calvin? Hey, Calvin. <laughs> 200 receptions. That's not bad. Damian Harris took his rightful place alongside the famed Alabama ball carriers of past years. Damien? Damien Hayes. Yeah. Rashawn Evans and Duran Payne and the rest of the defense beat opposing offenses into submission. Now, I've watched a lot of those games, and sometimes, as Coach Saban likes to say, you flat out made them quit. They quit. We're doing that to a lot of people, too. <laughs> I learned. Where's Bradley B? And uh, Rashawn and Daron. Where are you guys? Come here. You got Come Rashawn, you got Bradley. Bradley. <laughs> that money's going to be pouring in. Look at the size of these guys. So, Bradley, great job. Offensive line kept the tide rolling downhill, and Bradley got the win of his lifetime after the big game when his girlfriend agreed to say, yes, I will marry you. She's still with you? She's still there. That's good. There was one moment when it looked grim for Alabama in the title game. On the first play of overtime, Georgia sacked Tua for a big loss. Where's Tua? Where's Tua? Tua. What are you doing up there? What's he doing up there? But that was the only loss they got you for. But the Crimson Tide never gave in, never even a little bit, and uh, it just worked out. On the very next play, Tua dropped back to pass, Launched the ball from near midfield. I was watching. And the entire country watched as arms lifted up. And Devante Smith caught that ball for the win. Devante. And that was an amazing win. Devante. Where's Devante? What's going on over here? <laughs> Unbelievable throw and a catch. Every moment of hard work and preparation for Alabama paid off. We're proud of you. We're proud of your teammates. Each member of this incredible football program, you can all be proud of yourselves. We're proud of the way you play. We're proud of the way you represent yourselves, your university, and your state. And that is a great, great state. I know, because I won it by 32 points. <laughs> I actually think more than that, but... Anyway, you know, with the press, you like to keep it low because they'll always correct you. And we're proud to once again call the University of Alabama our national champions. Thank you and roll tide. It's a, a great honor of mine to introduce a man I have a lot of respect for. Don't know him. Got to know him today in the Oval Office. And you've been here six times, but it's your first time in the Oval Office. They didn't invite you, the other president. They don't invite you, see? <laughs> Trump invites you. But he is a great coach, and you know, he's a great winner. I think more than anything else, he's a great winner. Coach Nick Saban. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. You know, not many people get invited to the White House, so uh, not many people get invited to see the president and meet the president. Uh, so this is a special day for our team, uh, a team that 
uh, is being honored here because of their achievements in terms of winning the college football national championship, which makes me very proud. Uh, this season was a little bit of a metaphor of life uh, in terms of uh, the togetherness, the hard work, the perseverance that these young men sort of put together to overcome a lot of adversity, uh, to create a legacy for a lifetime and a memory for a lifetime for them uh, because of what they were able to accomplish together as a team. Uh, this group of young men uh, will also uh, learn a lot of lessons, I think, that will help them be more successful in life because of the experiences they had together this year as a team. Uh, special thanks to our administration, Dr. Bell, our athletic director, Greg Byrne, uh, and all the supporters of Alabama football who make our team special. And a special thanks to President, uh, our president to invite us here and make this a special day for us. President Trump, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. And because of our gratitude, our captains would like to make a presentation uh, to our president. Captains. Looks good. Now put it up. Skill player, too. So there you have it. The president being awarded the uh, honorary jersey and uh, Nick Saban once again making it to the White House. Uh, seems like a tradition that we see not every year, but pretty much every uh, every other year or thereabouts. Uh, we appreciate uh, uh, you being with us uh, for that part of our program. We are going to take a short break. Much more to come. Somebody who uh, had some success against the Crimson Tide this year, Daniel Carlson, the All-American kicker from Auburn. He is uh, hoping to land a spot in the uh, NFL, and we'll talk to Daniel coming up next. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. You're not worth a thrill. Welcome back. Uh, we're, uh, we've been talking about the trip to the White House, and uh, our next guest probably would have uh, preferred being at the White House right now than uh, joining us, Daniel Carlson, the great uh, kicker uh, from Auburn. Uh, he at least can say that uh, he beat the national champion. Uh, Daniel, I, we were just watching the Alabama team at at the White House mm-hmm. a few minutes ago, but uh, I'm sure you have some mixed feelings, but you did uh, beat the Crimson Tide this year. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, they might they might be national champs, but I, I'd say we're state champs, so we'll, we'll <laughs> take what we can get. Well, you guys had a, had a pretty amazing season. We had Coach Malzahn on Friday before the scrimmage, and mm-hmm. uh, Let's talk about you. I mean, I know there's another Carlson uh, on on the on the team. Yeah. Uh, we, before we get to you, let's talk about him. Uh, how do you grade his progress so far? Um, I think he's doing great. Um, I've had, I've had a chance to kind of stick here in Auburn, um, so I got to check him out at a scrimmage um, last week, and he had a 62 yard field goal in a live scrimmage. So, you know that that's not too bad for the little brother. Um, and then obviously in the 8A game, I think he had a real good game. He had four for four in field goals and. He's looking like uh, a lot like his big brother, so I'm excited to watch watch what he can do in his career. Well, having met you and, uh, and knowing your your story, you, you you're heading for, toward a great success, uh, no matter what you end up doing. Uh, but let's talk about uh, playing professional football. Uh, mm-hmm. Where are you right now on that journey? Yeah, right now I'm uh, sitting and waiting. Um, basically, I've just gotten through with all my uh, private workouts with different teams, um, so. I've had about five teams fly out and uh, work me out, kick kick with me, um, just in person here in Auburn. So um, I would say those are the top five teams that are looking at me. Um, obviously, the NFL draft is a little different for a kicker than other positions. You know, there's only there's only so many teams that actually need a kicker. Where most teams, you know, are going to take a quarterback or some offensive line um, player. So um, you know, I. We'll see where I end up, but um, right now I'm just waiting after these workouts and um, waiting until the end of April. When you have uh, – listen, you, you've kicked under the most uh, extreme pressures that anyone could possibly kick under. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's, it, is it, what's it like and how different is it when you have professional people come in and, uh, and, and watch you? What are they looking for? Yeah, I think it, it's a lot different. Um, just a kind of more sterile environment where um, they're, they're controlling what kind of kicks your um, – hitting um you know sometimes they'll have you 
rush off the sideline um, and do a hurry up field goal or sometimes they'll just have you take your time and run you through a script um, so it's just I think for them another way to see you in different situations see how you respond to maybe a missed kick before um, and then how you respond in the next kick you know it's just a good way for them to get um, some extra information on you and then you know just hang out with you a little more to kind of get get a feel for who you are as a person um, and see what what you could possibly bring to the club team. so I mean again you, you said it under any other circumstances you, you would be uh, on the first day of the draft but kicking is, is, is a little <laughs> different um, so what yeah. will happen will you uh, you'll, you'll wait out the draft and then uh, will you then sign with a team yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, I'm going to fly back home to Colorado for the draft and um, pray a lot and just wait wait to see what happens. And, you know, hopefully, um, you know, sooner than later, a team will, will give me a call and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see where I end up going. But, um, you know, if that doesn't happen, we'll, we'll see what um, kind of team has the best possibility that they, they need someone to kind of fill in the role as a starting kicker because – Obviously, there's only 32 starting kickers in the league, and there, there's a lot of good um, other kickers coming out of college or still just waiting uh, for a call in free agency. If for some reason, uh, Daniel, you don't end up uh, playing uh, in the NFL, what will you do? I don't know. I, I, I would keep playing for a while. I okay. would keep trying. Um, so, you know, I, I'd give it a year or two, and then uh, after that, I'd probably have to find something to start paying the bills. But, um you know, I, I would definitely keep trying, and I'll, I don't really doubt the the abilities there. So I just gotta I gotta have the right chance here. We uh, we every 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 afternoon and every evening on the show we talk about uh, the various McWhorter Award winners and nominees. You certainly are one from Auburn because of your uh, academic prowess. Uh, mm-hmm. Talk about I, I am I mean I, I think I had this conversation with once before, but uh, share with you the audience share with the audience your 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 pre, your studies and and what uh, what you would end up doing with that one day if you you don't play in the nfl yeah um i actually finished my undergrad in three years um and did that in marketing and then i i'm finishing my last class online right now for my uh, masters of business administration and so it's it's nice and broad um and it gives me a lot of options of what i want to do um hopefully later after football ends um hopefully years and years of NFL kicking, um, and then I would love to somehow get involved in the community I'm in. Um, you know, all the NFL teams are obviously in big cities, so um, I'm recently married, and she is a social worker, um, and so we could kind of team up is what our idea is, and, you know, whether it's start a foundation or uh, come alongside a church foundation, whatever it is, um, kind of use our common interest and in, um, our faith and um, help, helping others um, to do something like that. Yeah, Daniel, I remember talking to you. Uh, I think it was last uh, last fall, and your your wedding yeah. day was pretty close to the end of the season, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. It was. It was January thirteenth. Yeah, so I, I was. Not, I was warning you. After, you yeah. might. You might have the uh, national championships <laughs> to deal with, but uh, made made sure we planned around that. Yeah, planned after that, just in case. Let me uh, go back to it because this Auburn season uh, was was just so interesting. The way uh, the Tigers, yeah. uh, you know, were so dominant uh, and, and had so many significant victories. I mean, how often uh, does anyone ever take part in, in within within a three week period beating the, the top team in the country? Mm-hmm. What was that like? Absolutely, it was unbelievable. Um, and you know, that's why I came back this year. I, I thought we'd have a special season, and and that's what it was. You know, there were, there were some obviously ups and downs, but. Um, you know, especially towards the end of the season when we, we beat Bama and Georgia, like you said, two, two number one teams at the time. Um, you know, it was unbelievable. And, you know, I, I didn't feel like we could lose at all at that point. Um, obviously, things didn't end right way, um, the way we hoped. But um, it, was, it was really a special season, a great way to kind of end my career here at Auburn um, and kind of pass, pass the torch to, to my little brother. And if you had to uh, characterize him, or at least from a from a your standpoint, uh, how mm-hmm. how would he? I don't claim to know anything about kicking, other than I get nervous <laughs> watching you guys. But how how would he compare to <laughs> you? Uh, I mean, you were one of the best kickers in the country. Yeah, he, he's very similar. I think a lot of people are going to be confused next year when they see uh, Carlson. You know, he he looks the exact same as me. He's about the same height 
tall, skinny, blonde, um, Swedish-looking guy. So um, <laughs> he, he's, he's going to confuse some people, maybe um, make them think I'm sticking around for six years or something. But um, he, he's got a very strong leg, and I think that's going to be very apparent um, pretty early on. So I, I'm excited to see him do some exciting things. Well, Daniel, congratulations again on uh, getting married and, and an incredible career. And uh, I really hope you make it because uh, you, you're an inspiration to so many people that this really is about uh, uh, being a student athlete, and, and you, you have yeah. personified that. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Great to see you again. Thank you. Daniel Carlson, uh, who may have, uh, on his way out of town in Auburn, uh, upset a few people with his comment, they may be the national champions, but we're the state champions. And uh, truer words, uh, that's exactly right. Auburn did beat Alabama this year, although uh, nobody at the White House, at the, as we speak, probably is overly concerned about that. More to come on the program. Your phone calls at 855-242-7285. We'll uh, have a live report from the White House a little bit later in the show from Philip Stutz on what it was like being there, watching it all. We had it right here for you as well. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Daryl is up next. You know, one thing for sure, okay, on this show, you can bet on. If you want to hear a college football team live at the White House regarding the national championship, there's only one requirement, and that is Alabama winning it, right? Do you agree with that? Uh, you know, Daryl, I bet uh, we would have been more than happy to cover Georgia's trip to the net, to the White House <laughs> Paul, today. Whatever, whatever, Paul. Who else have you yeah. ever covered at the White House besides Alabama? Uh, and, you know, Daryl, we would have who covered it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure someone covered Georgia's last well, trip to the White House you covered at the White with House uh, Jimmy Alabama? Carter as president you can't answer, or somebody. Can you? Okay, then let's move on to my next question, okay? I, I would agree Alabama sets the bar in college football. Would you agree with that? What's that, there, Daryl? I couldn't, Alabama sets the bar in college football. I mean, they're, they're the greatest, right? They are, which I can only assume with them being the greatest that it's much tougher to win the SEC title than the national. Hey, by the way, Daryl, don't, 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 don't be upset. Daryl, slow down. Daryl, slow down. Well, 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 no, nobody well, wants to hear you. a hyena talk, if okay? If three people have an opinion of something, it's obvious, Chris. You need to shut your mouth. No, no, no I, I don't need to shut my mouth, I have a question for you. Uh, why do you feel the need? Why do you why do you feel the need to talk over people? Because I wanted to say something I thought it's was wrong. Well, you 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 go you get your turn. Da- it's very rude. Danny, it's uh, very Darryl. annoying, and it happens. It happens quite often, Paul. Darryl, it's a mean caller. I this, know your mother a, raised uh, you better than that. I know it, your mother raised you much is this better than that. Program of democracy. When did that start? I mean, you just, I don't understand why you feel the need you have to talk over me. There's stuff I wanted to say yesterday. I never got a chance to say because you kept talking over me. You wouldn't shut up. You told me I man wouldn't shut up. You wouldn't shut up. You kept going on and on and on. I want to point out yesterday how that kid, when he got kicked out of Georgia, he went to Augusta State and led them to a national title, co-anchored it, which would be the equivalent of what? Maybe a West Georgia or Georgia Southern winning the national championship in college football, Division 1A? And then when they built a trophy case, they didn't have a trophy case, he told them, you know what, you built it too small. You should have built it for two because we're going to win again next year. And he went back the next year and won another one. I want to point that out yesterday because I thought that was just an unbelievable feat that the, for a school like that to win a national championship. And they beat Georgia the Stimmies also, which is probably why a lot of Georgia fans have heartburns with that guy, for Patrick Reed. But, yeah, I never got to point any of that out because you wouldn't shut up. So my question is, once again, you still haven't answered it. Why do you feel the need to want to talk over people? Oh, now you can't hear me, huh? I know them ears, that, them ears you guys can hear anything, okay? I know you hear what I say. So it's your turn to speak. Go ahead. I know your mama taught you better than that. Your mama told you everything you know, okay? There's no doubt in my mind about that. There's one thing that she didn't tell you, though, Paul. She didn't tell you that I was your daddy to you, Paul. Did I miss anything? Anyway, Daryl, what I was trying to tell you was I just saw something. Uh, Caitlin Collins, who covers the White House for CNN, tweeted that she had just interviewed Nick Saban, and he was calling recruits from the White House. So what happens when you get to go to the White House? <sighs> By the way, I, I should take naps more often. I, I felt much more. I feel much more refreshed sleeping through Daryl's calls. How about Hambone up next? What do you say, Hambone? Daryl's daddy is in the White House in Washington, D.C., and his name is Nick Saban. He took him out behind the woodshed and gave him a good whooping. That's what's wrong with him, Paul. Thank you so much for that call. 
Steve is in Knoxville. How are you, Steve? Hey, Paul. How come I always have to come on after Daryl? I don't understand why you put me on after Daryl. Well, I apologize. I really do. You, you won't have to do, you won't have to do that tomorrow because we're not talking to Daryl tomorrow. Oh, come on. I got to have him sunglasses on, Paul. I know you can answer my question. You taking a nap? Your mama taught you better than that. My mama, my, on, way, my mother, my mama did teach me better than to talk to Daryl. Yeah, because your mama was from Memphis, wasn't she? She was Martha Nan Memphis. <laughs> my mother's side of the family was from Memphis, Paul. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, I was the only person in my family born in Memphis. Oh, were you? Yeah. Well, I got a question. Uh, I saw uh, the White House broadcast, and you mentioned something about uh, the president asking him to become the chief of staff. And Nick Saban looked more comfortable up there in the White House than the president did. It looked like he'd been there longer. And you know, um, I, I agree. Uh, I think say I, I don't know. For some reason, I think Saban was thinking, you know what? I could win this job. Oh yeah, he looked like he had it. Like he was the man of the palace. I think he said to uh, President Trump, "How long you got this gig for?" <laughs> yeah, because uh, you know uh, you're going to get fired. And uh, oh, I saw our boy Reed on the um, uh, morning talk show this morning. Uh, oh, really? Regis and Kathy, they're not Regis anymore. It's R- Ryan, Ryan, Se- Ryan Seacrest. Yeah. And he, is I miss Regis goofy. by the way. You know, still alive. I, I was. Where is, where is Reege? Reege, where are you, man? We'll be right back. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Put a little carry on the car. It was BYOG, bring your own guts. This is the best, the best. Do you hear me? Of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Welcome back to the program. It's been a good one. We had uh, live coverage from the White House earlier where we heard from the President of the United States. And then the most powerful man in the world, Nick Saban. Welcome back. We are going to take your phone calls and nothing more pleasant than to begin the second hour of the show than going to Jim. Now you're going to let me talk blanket, aren't you? Just like what I told or what I asked Tammy on that clip you run every day, which is, by the way, the most compelling clip on on any of that uh, song deal that you put on, as you well know. Right. Correct. Okay, thank you for agreeing. You know, Paul, uh, I heard the Goobers uh, earlier in the show, you know, the John idiot from, and uh, what's his name, the other guy? Mark. Mark, you know, the ones that, uh, the ones that trashed me and you said don't mess around with Jim. Uh, you know, they don't recognize, they don't want to recognize Radio Gold. You know that's what the truth is. But, Paul, here's why I call. You let these Goobers in there in the other room, the background clowns, make another Im- just unbelievable stupid statement and you didn't correct it I, that's why you got me hanging around to correct these kind of crazy things that come out of their mouths hey he said a while ago obviously he said here's what he said you heard him well uh, you know par is expected expected only by tiger woods and that kind of player and me that's what it's, that's what jim par, par is ooh. jim 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 par is expected by every golfer on the PGA tour like that is what is expected of them you can't be on the PGA tour without oh, shooting will you, will par you let this or guy below. stand down and he's interrupting my call stand down jim i'll stand down just want to make myself clear you we're didn't make the PGA nothing tour but an idiotic statement. let me finish. let me we're Paul, not talking talk. about guys out at the Tuscaloosa Country Club who are shooting up, over moron. their You don't age. know what you're talking about. Paul, what are hey, you going to hey, do? Stand down, down Vickers. Not? Stand down, Vickers. Here's what I'm saying, Paul. Par is, is not expected. Par is the standing, standard of excellence on a golf course. Most people ask, is expected to shoot 90, like you, Paul, like you. That's what We're not expected. talking about most people. We're talking about the players on the PGA Tour I didn't and call the new you. slogan for the Professional Golf Association. <laughs> okay. Not uh, the Tuscaloosa okay, Country okay, Club. Okay, okay, we heard you, John. Show some Again, respect, Paul, show some respect I, I, to the call. I don't even want to call you show because you got them stupid morons interrupting – I'm okay, trying Jim, to make a Jim, point, the, but I, I think stage. I made the point. You know what I'm saying is true, Paul. Of course you. You're always right, Jim. Well, you know I'm right here. Pa is not expected. That's not a sta- It's the standard of excellence on the golf course. Jim, I apologize. Uh, Kubiak was talking to me while you were talking to me. 
Look, Paul, it's all right with me if you want to trample all over the radio gold that you I don't, want. Jim, I do not. I do not. I do not. That Jim, is radio gold. Jim, I can't the, help it. The floor is yours. No, it's all right. I made the point. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> What did you? What were you asking me? I was. I just wanted to know if he, if Jim was a fan of the Mamas and the Papas, and if his favorite song was "Look Through My Window." I bet it's California Dreaming. You think it's on such a winter's day? Does he like Johnny Cash? All the leaves. God around. ain't no stained glass window. Kudos out the wonder. Oh, you got. You guys are so cruel. Kudos out the wonder. <laughs> Here we have Radio Gold. And the guys in the other room want, want to make fun of him. Kudos out the wonder. Not funny. Well, it's obvious he's not right here right now. He's right out of here. You're out of here. You know, and he says wonder just like me. He, see, I love it when Jim quotes me. He's riding my coattails. He always has. Now, Paul, let me ask you about this, this spiritually sick comment he made about me. He said I was spiritually sick. Do you think I'm spiritually sick? Whatever that I, means. I don't even know what it means, no. Well, but you, you know something, I mean, even if I even if I thought you were spiritually sick, I would not offer that opinion because that is not for me to judge another man's heart. Exactly, so. exactly. But I will say this, and you've known me; you've seen me at all these different events. I give my time with nothing and expect. I expect nothing back. There's no expectations. Do I get maybe a sandwich or a, a, a drink, maybe Gatorade or something? Absolutely. You've never seen me with an alcoholic beverage, although I could have ordered You know, I think we never broke did. bread uh, that time in Columbus, Georgia, and I, I, always, I, I regret that. You know why? Because, because I, didn't, I, was, I was unable to talk to you because Daryl was at the same table. And, and Daryl talked, talked, talked just like he did. I guess his mama didn't teach him like your mama taught you and mine taught me, well, my grandmother. But, but you know, I, I love the fact that he called me spiritually sick because he spent all of his time talking about me. And then, of course, he shifts over to Squirrel, and he spends the rest of the time talking about Squirrel. So it's obvious that I'm in and Squirrel are knee-deep in this guy's head. Because he can't get past it. Because you know why? Because he's right out of here. But you know, Paul, when you say something like this guy is spiritually sick, and he's a serpent of the devil, or whatever, ever what that term was, what what are you when you call up on a live radio show in front of the world and the astronauts on the space lab and anything else is floating around there and take prayers back from a person that needs prayers? What are you? What definition is that? Because we heard Jim do it, and we heard him say it. And he also said he was better than Ted Williams, although Ted Williams is nothing but a frozen head. It's not hard to be better than Ted Williams right right now if your head is attached to your neck, to your shoulders, to your feet, and you're about 98.6 degrees. You can always be better than Ted Williams at this point because you can always be better than a frozen head, unless, of course, you're a frozen daiquiri. We're damn make a world getting faster. Catherine is in Memphis, and you are next up. Uh, hello, Catherine. Oh, hey, Paul. Um, thank you, sir, for taking my call. Um, I need you to be a tie break between myself and my dad. We're having an argument over um, Brett Bielema's possible future, if there is one for him, uh, coaching. Um, uh, I just would like your opinion on where you think he could possibly end up in the coaching sphere. I know – my dad's argument is he had a really good tenure at Wisconsin and then obviously at Arkansas that wasn't replicated. Um, so he thinks his Wisconsin tenure could possibly get him somewhere else. Um, but I'm kind of on the um, thinking that his tenure at Arkansas muddied the water so bad where he might struggle to find something. So, I was just curious on yeah, where you, you think. know, Catherine, it's, it, it's an interesting question. I think the immediate reaction would be on your side, but, but I also will say this. Brett Bielema is an engaging personality, and I think somewhere he will get another job. Uh, he's a young enough guy. He has a good resume. And, 
it wasn't one thing that happened to him that will cost him in the future. Uh, it's not like there's any scandal in his background. Uh, he, he has a he has a great family. Uh, just had a child. So I mean, I think it, I think depending on where, I, I, I think probably Midwest somewhere uh, out of the South, where I don't think he'll find work again. But I, I do think Brett uh, will probably go into broadcasting. Uh, maybe rehabilitate himself a little bit, and, and, and I suspect he'll have another head coaching job. Uh, do you think the NFL is a possibility for him as a coordinator uh, or anything? Yeah, but, but I, I think he's a college coach. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, good to hear from you. Rob in Missouri, you're on the air. Go right ahead. Hey, Paul. Uh, you know, I just heard that spiritually sick thing. I'm currently a student. I'm going to bring that to my philosophy professor, see if he can go crazy with it. I don't know what that meant. But anyway, I just heard about that Shea Patterson story, and I, I think it's kind of sick that this school would kind of, that Ole Miss would run interference on a kid that's just trying to get his value up right away. And, you know, it's just a problem that I think, I don't know if the NCAA has to make a rule change on it, that these sort of old schools can kind of run interference on these kids who are just trying to play ball and try to make some money for themselves. But I don't know. I was wondering what you thought about it, what you thought of the situation. And Ole Miss was just, you know, playing within the rules, so they were it's kind of fair game or something along those lines. Yeah, listen, uh, you, you have to have some protections. Uh, I do understand that. I understand Ole Miss's side of the story. I think they're just doing this because if they don't do it, the floodgates will open, and I think they're trying to protect the integrity of the university. Right, right. I, I you know, I understand that. But I mean, but, but, uh, with- let me let me say that's what I think they're doing. On the other hand, I'm for young people being able to go and do whatever they want. Uh, right, right. You know, if a coach this leaves, uh, in, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't like I don't like universities, regardless of where it is or, or why it is. Be, to be to be uh, to me, uh, if coaches can leave, so can players. But I understand why the universities have to do this though right yeah it's like you're playing within the rules and it's yeah. a precedent and you know it's also not going too well for basketball as well they're like trying to find this one way inside the rules they can take advantage of the system and i don't know if it's something they'll you know eventually have to address or you know that there are some kids who are going to the g league straight out of college now instead of playing basketball so i think it's an important the, the problem though is uh, in i i've heard this argument many times i you know I, well, you know, you sign a contract. Well, let's say whether it's a, an NDA or, a, or, or or an employment contract, and you go, "I want to leave." Well, you sign the contract, though. Uh, so right. somewhere along the line, if, if you if 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 I, if I sign a contract, uh, you know, then I change my mind. There has to be mitigating circumstances. In this case, there are. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Shea Patterson is not the, the school. The, the dynamics of the school have changed. Uh, right. they're, they're in trouble. Uh, they're, 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 they're very likely not going to a bowl game this year if the appeal is not, uh, granted. So he's claiming a different coach. It's an argument. Uh, both sides have a legitimate, uh, argument. It's just, uh, determined, mm-hmm. you know, if more than likely though, uh, you know, which argument wins and, and that's where this mm-hmm. will be determined. But if Ole Miss doesn't try to protect their university, then players will just start bailing out left and right. Well, yeah, especially that school. I mean, they've just sort of been getting the short end of it for the last couple of years. And they're, and they're now, I, I mean, I don't think it, I, I listen, I don't think Shea Patterson's coming back to Ole Miss, do you? I, I don't think so. No. Not after, uh, it didn't really look like they had his back. I don't think he would come back after that. And, uh, I don't know. I mean, they're sort of rebuilding. And if he kind of wants to establish himself, then. And by the way, they're, they're, they've already like settled Michigan. on a new quarterback, too. Yeah, yeah, they're moving on. But that's the thing with the SEC. New quarterbacks coming every day. Like, you thought that Jacob Eason had a job until they a, a completely new kid took him to the national championship. So you never really know. And they're just there's a hot new kid coming up every single day. And Georgia already signed a new QB already. Well done. Hey, thank you for the call. Appreciate it. Uh, 855-242-7285. Matt is up next. Matt, what do you got? Hey, Matt? Paul, how are you? We are doing hey, well. I was calling in defense of Jim. I, you know, the other day when you were talking to Squirrel, Squirrel's been attacking me on Twitter. He's called me every expletive in the book. You know, I don't agree with everything Jim says, but Jim brings an element to your show where you listen. You know, when Jim didn't call in for months, 
people talked about Jim not calling in for months. You know, Squirrel just calls up here and he just attacks everybody and, 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 and you know, he attacks me. He says I'm the village idiot. I hate to break the squirrel. He ought to come to Georgia. I'll show him village idiot. You know, he can come up to SEC media days. But, um, you know, he, he, you know, if you've got a criti- – you know, I may criticize Alabama fans, the stereotypical Alabama fan, but it's purely meant as a joke. But Squirrel – I mean, I've gotten tweets all day while at work how I'm the village idiot, how I'm a moron, blah, blah, blah. And how so, so, so I- Matt, you are showing solidarity with Jim, correct? I'm not saying I support Jim. I'm saying that Jim brings an element. You need so you, you like feel Jim like you, you, and, you and Jim are something unique on this show. Is that fair? We get we get things going when 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 so Jim you are calls, now you are now in the uh, in the in the pantheon of Jim from Tuscaloosa. Correct. I'm not saying I'm as crazy as Jim. That one that the doctor who called in two weeks ago sounded like Paul Bear, but um. Well, listen. You're, you're either you're either you need to understand something, Matt. I'm with Jim. You're either with Jim or you're support, against Jim. There's no in between. You, you can't I, I be halfway. Him. I support okay. him because Jim. He's like you know, Tiger Woods. Golf needs Tiger Woods. Okay. And, when this, Tiger and, was and you're, winning you're suggesting this show needs Jim. Is that fair? I'm not saying this show would well, what are, what are you saying, air. Matt? I mean, which side of the I'm mouth are you going to talk about? I'm saying the show is better off with Jim. I'm showing the show does better with Jim. And do you think the show is better off with you? Oh, heck yeah. Because I present another dog fam, you know. Because, and, what do you, I mean, and what do you think of Daryl? I think Daryl's a knowledgeable dog fan. I just think he gets going too fast. But I think he... I think he presents some interesting facts. Okay. I will say this, though. I was just glad to be at the national championship game last year. Alabama beat us, okay. but I was, I was glad to be there. You, you know, we hadn't here. been there in 100 years. Yeah, no, it was only you know? 30, uh, 30, 30, 38. So it, did it suck to lose? Yes, it sucked to lose. I walked out of Atlanta Falcons Stadium. I walked out of the Rose Bowl. You know, you you know, I mean, two years ago, your alma mater. I mean, that was a heartbreaker. I was in my uh, my my regular seats when they threw that hell mary. Okay, listen, they're rushing me along, Matt. Thanks for the call, Jim. I'm sure appreciate your half support. We will uh, head back to Washington D.C. shortly to get a uh, inside the ropes view of what happened at the White House today with the president and Nick Saban. More to come. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Glad you're here. Uh, appreciate the calls. Let's uh, talk to Drew in Jersey. How are you, Drew? Great. How are you, Paul? It's we been are. the third time I've been on the show. So today, you know, uh, we haven't called for a while. You know, it's been a long time. And a lot has gone on in the last few weeks. Well, glad to have you back, Drew. Well, there's a lot of great news. Um, so what's up with the... So how how did Michigan how did Michigan defeat Loyola Chicago? Like I found that surprising. Yeah, I mean I just think they finally wore them down. Uh, I mean Michigan, uh, I can't remember if that's the game they hit all the threes or not. I mean the tournament seems like a, a blur to me, but I, but I think that's what happened. And UConn and Notre Dame, like what 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 was up with that? You know, it was all because of that one buzzer shot that's happened twice in a row. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, but by the way, I need to ask you this, uh, Drew. This is this stuff's all like two weeks ago. Where you been? Um, Mexico. Oh on my PK. goodness! So you went to Mexico for spring break? Yeah. Way down there in Mexico, huh? Yeah, like way down at the bottom. What did you? Where, where did you go? And what did you do? Well, we went to Cancun, and um, we had two other families going with us. Um, yeah. The food was great. That was probably my favorite part. What kind of, uh, I mean, I know this is kind of a loaded question, but what kind of food did they have in Mexico that you liked? I like the um, pork tacos. Pork tacos? Yeah, they're good. Um, but anyways, um, what's up with all your do you, uh Do you normally have like a spring trip somewhere? Or is that is that the way it works in your family? Yeah, normally. But we don't go on like much vacation besides that. I mean, sometimes... We'll go to Pennsylvania or Maine, you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. Like but no, pretty, like, actual 
virtual vacation for like different countries, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty cool family. I wonder if uh, you got a, you got a, you got an open spot. I'd like to make an application. <laughs> well, I I have a question about your callers. How come you guys always get the same people? Jim, some other okay, guys. Okay, okay, hold on a second, Drew. Alabama, I need to, I need now I need to get your opinion. You're what eleven? Is that right? Ten. Ten. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So as a ten year old from New Jersey, oh. now you're right outside of uh, Manhattan. Is that correct? Yeah, about like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, really okay. not that far at all. You're, you're in the suburbs. As a 10-year-old right outside New York, mm-hmm. what, is your, what is your opinion of Jim from Tuscaloosa? Who? Yeah, the, Jim, the guy that called in a minute ago. Oh, I think we're like one of the biggest rivals that call on the show. Because you talked about a couple of weeks about about me and Jim from, from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Yeah. Do you do you uh, do you like him? Is there about uh, is there a lot about his calls that you're learning from or not? No, it's just like you know he's always calling. You know you have the same call callers and they're all and they're all from Alabama. Yeah, it's a big state. Yeah, not as big as New, not as big as New Jersey, but well, how well help me with this, uh, Drew? I'm new to the business. How can we expand our caller base outside of Alabama? Well. You know, I, I've never seen any callers from like Wyoming or North Dakota. No, or South there, Dakota. you know, you know why, uh, Drew? Yeah, no one lives there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's like there's like ten people in Wyoming and thirteen people in uh, North Dakota. Yeah, so and you won't all, get and, 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 and two of them just froze to death. <laughs> well, how come most of your callers are from Alabama? We're, we've there? been asking the same question, but, uh, well, we got you on the line. Yeah, I think there was some other guy from New Jersey that called. Yeah, we have uh, Casey. He's a golf pro in New Jersey. Wait, where do you live? Where do I live? No, um, where, well, Casey where is that lives, Casey? Um, where, where does Casey live? Um, Colonia, New Jersey. Oh, yeah, I know where that is. It's down, like, south, southwestern Jersey. Or is it Western Jersey? I forget where it's Yeah, I think, I think it's Southwest. Mm. Well, how I big do you think the Philly. upset against UConn and Notre Dame was in women's basketball? Yeah, that was a pretty amazing game. Are you a, are you a UConn fan? Yeah, I go for UConn just because of their record, you know? So, okay, who, your favorite teams are. Uh, give, give them all to me. You're talking like college teams? College, pro, doesn't matter. Yeah, I like... Um, College, I like, you know, I like um, Alabama. I've talked about Alabama a ton. Um, I also like to go for Seton Hall. I told you that. Um, I, yeah, I go for UConn. Um, you know, it's a team that um, I kind of like their logo and their color, Alabama A&M. Yeah. Yeah, I like their logo for some reason. That's good. Well, listen, uh, Drew, glad yeah. you're back in the country. Hope you'll call yeah. more. All right. Also, quick question. And uh, when we come back, Drew, uh, don't go anywhere. We're going to the White House. Have you ever been there? Uh, no. You need Never to get been there. To- it's really a cool place. We are going to take a break. Uh, Philip Stutz at the White House will be joining us next. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. You're not worth a flip. Welcome back to the program. We are glad you're here. It has been a busy one today. I uh, spent a lot of time early uh, giving you live coverage of Alabama being celebrated again at the, at the White House. We had the president and we also uh, heard from Nick Saban. Uh, now we're going to hear from Philip Stutz, who does, who's not a reporter, uh, but he's a friend of ours. And uh, somehow Philip, with all his great influence in Washington as a uh, political and, and media strategist, uh, managed to... An invite, uh, which isn't surprising because Philip uh, hangs out at the White House and Capitol and pretty much everywhere else where power uh, matters. Uh, Philip, thank you for the time. Uh, appreciate you being with us. And uh, I'm just going to sit back and listen to you describe what you uh, witnessed and experienced earlier, not that long ago, at the White House. Good afternoon. Hey, Paul. Good to hear from you. Uh, yeah, I am not a reporter, but I do play one on your show. So, uh, let's well, by the way, you, you, not a, only I, you're, I, you're not a reporter, you're, you're also a best-selling author. We had you on a couple weeks ago for Fire yeah. Them Up, the uh, seven uh, digital, uh, seven lies digital marketers sell. So you, you, I'm sure you dropped a few uh, books off for the president and, and uh, Mrs. Trump. 
I had him sign a few. All right, let me give you some of the key highlights. Uh, first of all, best dressed. Tony Brown, uh, who wore a black fur hat, uh, almost Russian-esque. I don't know if there was well. a subliminal message or not. Uh, I had a, uh, a good conversation with Senator Doug Jones, who told me to tell you hello. And hey, by the way, the uh, last, one of yeah. the last times that uh, Alabama was yes, at the White House, Senator Jones actually was our correspondent. He, he may have told you that. He did. That's what he said. He goes, <laughs> you know, the last time I told the old fine bomb, I was right here. So uh, he said uh, hello. Um, and uh, I didn't quite get on the front row, Paul. I was on uh, the second row, seat 26. Ooh. And so if any Georgia fan is, is smart enough to understand that message, then uh, they'll know that that's second and 26. So uh, Two, two twenty six. amazing day out there today. It was really, really fun. Uh, you know, uh, the president made a lot of jokes. Uh, and one of them was uh, that no uh, previous visit to the White House had ever invited Saban into the Oval Office. And uh, so he needled past administrations on that one. And, uh, you know, the, the team, everybody was very receptive. It was a great event out there. I want to I focus on that for a second because uh, it, it's just hard to imagine uh, the president not having Coach Saban in. But as you know, you were there. These things are fairly quick and staged, and the president has other things going on. Uh, so, uh, but that, that was pretty cool to go on. I mean, that's, that's as you know, uh, you've been there enough times. That that is the spot in the White House that everyone yearns for. So totally true. And another mutual friend of ours is uh, Caitlin Collins, the White House correspondent for CNN, and she is. Uh, she told me on the grounds that Saban was making recruiting calls from the White House. Oh my that goodness! Is, that is not a joke. Is he that really against uh, federal election law? <laughs> Only if he paid them. <laughs> so he didn't do that. <laughs> Now, no, if 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 the pre, if Saban had been sitting there, standing there in the Oval Office, and he put the president on, that that would be some sort of uh, violation, wouldn't it? I I think it's just great recruiting as an Alabama <laughs> alum. <laughs> we always we always try to get the most objective reporters on. When Doug Jones, who's got an Alabama connection, we we don't we don't uh, we don't strive uh, for anything other than. Uh, Fair and balanced here on the Fine Bomb Show. So uh, we, we had it. We, we watched. We, we had. We broadcast it. We saw it. But we, there's only so much you can see on television. Uh, give us some of the uh, behind the scenes uh, machinations going on there today. It was pretty neat. You know, when the when the song of the, the, the president song comes out and the horns go off, uh, and the president comes out. He walked out with Coach Saban. The team kind of came from the White House and walked down the steps that you see them standing on, and a uh, huge press corps in the back snapping pictures. And, uh, you know, the president definitely had remarks, and he let, you know, one of the funnier moments, and maybe you saw this, but he said, you know, he made the remarks about how big the Alabama football team was, and he kept going back to how much money they will make one yeah. day. Yeah, oh, yeah. And everything was about, oh, you guys are going to make a lot of money. And, I mean, and it, it was funny. Everybody was laughing. And then, of course, Tua was way up above uh, on the steps, wasn't even close to the president. The president like, called him out and said, what are you doing up there? Come on down. And, uh, but it was funny. Uh, everybody had a good time. And, um, you know, we had U.S. senators there uh, with Doug Jones. Uh, we had all the congressmen there. We had Cabinet Secretaries Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, who's one there. of Saban's childhood friends, was there. Um, Sonny Perdue, the agriculture secretary, was there. So it was a really neat lineup. The, the, the most interesting guest of all, Jeff Sessions, was there on the front row. Yeah, no, it, it, uh, and for those who don't know who Jeff Sessions is, uh, he's a longtime uh, senator from, from Alabama who gave up his uh, seat uh, to when he was selected as the attorney general. He, he and the president were very close friends. And it was only yesterday, Philip, that the president called out Sessions again. He, he's done that more than once, Paul. <laughs> but he, uh, uh, I think, I think your, your, our mutual friend, uh, Caitlin, uh, asked him on the rope line what he thought, and he said, roll tide. Very, very noncommittal. Well, that's, that's a diplomat. And, you know, um, I was with a friend today, and he said, you know, with all the chaos that surrounds Washington, D.C., and, you know, at the same time we're at the White House, Mark Zuckerberg is testifying in Congress. It was a peaceful, quiet day, and you just couldn't believe that all the chaos was swirling around there. And 
Uh, Trump was humorous and fun, and the players reacted uh, very kindly to it, and it couldn't have gone better. And, and Philip, uh, to say the least, there is a lot going on. Uh, not only do we have the, the news from late last night, but uh, you have the Syrian conflict going on. The president canceled a trip to South America on Friday. So, uh, you listen, you, you have to know that in the Situation Room or wherever, uh, serious decisions are being made right now uh, about uh, about the Mideast. And meanwhile, he you would you would never have noticed when uh, watching the president uh, uh, on stage uh, with, with the Alabama Crimson Tide. I think you get a sense that the president loves these moments uh, of fellowship uh, with the players. Uh, you know, obviously his past with football and professional football yeah. with the USFL. Uh, you could really get a sense that this was a moment where he could, like, relax. And he took pictures for at least 20 minutes after the event. Uh, the Literally, the Secret Service was finally like, sir, you've got to go. But he was having a blast out there. Uh, it was, it was uh, you could see how happy he it was. It looks like a it. pretty nice day for Washington this time of the year. It was 55 and sunny, the most beautiful time of year to ever be in Washington, D.C. is in the spring. And uh, the cherry blossoms were out, and it was a great day. Philip Stutz uh, covering uh, the Alabama Crimson Tide uh, for us uh, at the, the White House. 20 minutes. I mean, Philip, uh, if I remember, la- not last year, the year before, uh, we had uh, coverage of it. Uh, President Obama, this was now his fourth time with Alabama. I mean, he, he was in and out uh, pretty quickly. It looked like, you know what, I've done this four times with you guys. I really don't have anything else to say. Uh, but spending 20 minutes taking pictures is extraordinary, isn't it? It was crazy, and yeah, there were a lot of fans there too, Paul. Um, and the the fan, the only complaint I heard the fans was they had to travel to another neutral site to see Alabama. <laughs> but but that, but overall, uh, the president was was literally it, it, taking pictures. Tell with me, every the, tell me player. this now again. The president reminded the Crimson Tide he was at the game, which uh, we yeah. all remember. He did it about three times actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. again. Uh, no reason. Uh, he, he he did fail to mention that he left while Alabama was down thirteen nothing. But that's but but why, why bother correcting the facts in Washington? But 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 Philip, I have to ask you this because uh, you know the White House is not an easy place to uh, snart uh, an invitation to. And forget you because you're a mover and shaker and uh, among the uh, the most influential uh, people in that city yeah. and what you do. But how, how does a normal – how do you get invited to something like this? Sure. First of all, your condescension I can feel through the phone right now. <laughs> and second, second of all, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of the uh, Alabama congressional offices and their okay. staffs. It's um, – you know, probably a lot of uh, lobbyists with connections. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, uh, there was a lot of Alabama. You would you'd be surprised at how much, you know, staff or people from the university were there. I saw um, the Board of Trustees, and they had their families there. Um, and, and so, and I saw Edgar Weldon there. And so, I, you know, an Alabama alum. Oh, very prominent so, person. You know, sure. Just a bunch, a bunch of people call and uh, come up and, uh, fly up and spend time. It's an o- incredible opportunity, um, no matter what the team is, for the president to honor their sports team and to have the opportunity to go up and spend the day at the White House is is unlike anything you'll ever have the opportunity to do. And people take advantage of that if they can. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I have to tell you, Philip, uh, and and you know, we've had uh, Senator Jones on this program many times, but. I am going to give you a higher mark for uh, reporting than Doug Jones. Uh, now, at the time, he was just a former U.S. attorney. Uh, he had not been elected to the Senate. But, but, but you, you, and I don't know what uh, Mark and John think, but I think Philip has pretty much won this job. Well, you know what? Uh, we're going to have to do some media training for him if, uh, if, if I'm ahead of him. So we'll, we'll go to work on that immediately. Yeah. I mean, he was kind of out of breath and – a little too partisan. I mean, you've you've, you've given us behind the scenes uh, minutia that I would expect from a seasoned veteran. So, uh, well done, Philip. I just want to know what recruits he was calling. That's all I care about. What, who is Nick Saban calling from the West Wing of the White House? Um, probably someone from a red state. That would be my guess. Hey, Trump made a good point. He did win Alabama by thirty-two points. <laughs> he sure did. He said, "Didn't he say like I think it was really more, but you know they took some away from me." Yeah, well, I, I think he knows that he doesn't get specific facts exactly right sometimes, and he thought that the press would jump all over him for it, too. 
Well, great stuff, Philip. Uh, we hopefully will see you very soon. Philip, who, uh, whose book fired them now, we had him on. Uh, by the way, it seems like that book's done quite well. Uh, it has, and uh, we're, we're rolling into the second part of this wave uh, in the next few weeks. I'm going to go into New York next week for another press blitz, but the book has been great. Feedback's been great. Thank you for having me on. Philip Stutz, White House correspondent for the Feinbaum Network. We appreciate it. Uh, great to have that. That was fun. That was really cool. Uh, and I know uh, this happens once a year, so why not blow it out? We are going to take a break. More of your phone calls at 855-242-7285. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Welcome back. Uh, glad you're here. So happy to have everybody on this uh Tuesday afternoon. Let's uh, go to John next up in Wyoming. Hello, John. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello, Paul. Hey, it's my pleasure to call you from the state of Wyoming. I actually live in Montana, but I'm driving across Wyoming right now. I have uh, family down here, and I've previously lived in Wyoming. I want to tell you and Drew that uh, you have fans here in Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota. I've lived there previously. And, uh, Paul, I listen to you frequently. I know you don't get a lot of callers in this country, but uh, you do a fantastic job, and I really appreciate it. Well, we're glad to hear that. No, uh, that that, uh, that warms my heart. Uh, and I, we were joking about uh, that part of the country. It's a beautiful part of the country, yes. but uh, as you, and, and one reason people like it so much, there aren't that many people. That's very true. And I, I know you were joking, and that's all uh, taken with – that's part of why I love to live here, too. I'm actually a Montana native. I lived all over the – Rockies over the years, but hey, I want to tell you, Paul, that I am a, a Crimson Tide fan. My uh, folks, my mother and father, both went to the University of Alabama in the 1940s, right after the war. Oh, my goodness. My dad was in, in World War II, and right after then, they went to the University of Alabama. So I was raised rooting for the Crimson Tide, and uh, I still cheer every one of their championships. Well, that is that, that is wonderful. John, thank you. I uh, really appreciate you your sure. call. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Great to hear from you. Yes. Great to hear from you. Uh, let's continue with more phone calls. And how about Chris in Texas? Welcome to the program, Chris. Yeah, hi, Paul. This is first time caller. Glad to talk to you. Thank you. Um, just to give you a preamble here, I'm, I'm a Texas a and fan, and I just happen to I, – I watch – I follow baseball, softball, and I just happen to catch the Florida-Alabama, the last, I guess, the rubber match. And um, – Typically, you know, most games I, I don't really see too many fans complaining about balls and strikes. So when I was watching the game, every time the pitcher for Florida would come up, probably maybe two thirds of the Alabama fans would complain about every single strike to the point where you got Bubba's come down from the top and almost cursing the, the umpire behind the plate. Oh, wow. And. That, that that's just that was just my observation. This was the game. Uh, uh, was this, this is the game last night. Is that what the one you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. It was a rubber match. Yeah. It was a rubber game. And then every time, you know, when when the when the Alabama pitcher would throw, you know, throw a ball, they complained just as bad. I've never seen fans so rabid and psychotic as the, as the Alabama fans. I think they need medication. So I, I, I'll stand by and just hear your explanation of why they just lose their freaking minds all the time yeah you know I, I i caught a few minutes of the game i didn't realize it was uh that bad chris thanks for the call from right outside of dallas barrett's lead later in the program we've had a busy one still two hours to go you're listening to the paul feinbaum show podcast put a little carry on the car He's the best, the best Do you hear me? of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. We welcome you back. First half dealt primarily with the White House, which is where Nick Saban was today, calling recruits right outside the Oval Office in the West Wing. We had live coverage for you. you also had, we also had Philip Stutz on uh, as well. Daniel Carlson as well. Got a few people fired up by saying that Auburn won the state championship this year. Alabama may have had the national, but we're the state Champions, uh, a couple of headlines to share with you before we get to the second half of the program. And uh, junior forward D.J. Hogg declares for the draft. Outstanding player helped the a and team to the Sweet 16. Lexington Herald, Roster Churn shows why it may be impossible for Cal to vi- build a veteran corps. We, where have we heard that before? 
Let's uh, get back to the calls. And uh, we just had Philip Stutz on. I thought Philip was outstanding on the program. Apparently, uh, you don't agree, right, Jim? I didn't say that. You did. There you go putting words in my mouth. What gets me is what you did. You replaced me. Who led you through the war, war zone of uh, all the year that Trump was trying to get elected? Who was your consultant then, Paul? You, Jim, were the first person I ever talked to that said they were, uh, they were supporting Donald Trump. And you gave Donald me the, uh, what was the position you gave me? Uh, you were the White House correspondent. Okay, why am I been replaced by bland, vanilla, little silly? Why, Paul? Um, okay, uh, well, uh, you're Paul Jim, the, actually, you're... you're, you're to the, get, get off the floor. Who, who's better than the radio goal of, of your show doing this kind of job rather than silly, whatever his name well, is? first of all, we, we, we have now... Re, we, we, you're, you're back to being the political correspondent. Well, I, I mean, really, Paul... I mean, you got you said the most compelling guy you have. Jim, what do you have against Philip Stutz? Oh, he's he's more compelling than me. Uh, Jim, I just asked you what you had against him. I got nothing except he's a except he's a leftist liberal. That's all I've got against. He's a, Jim, he's not a leftist liberal. Well, Doug Jones is, and and he's a buddy of Doug. No, 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 Jim. First of all, Doug Jones is a Democrat. Um, That's a liberal, Paul. Okay, I'm not going to argue. Um, Philip Stutz is a Republican, I think. Well, he doesn't act All right. he did, Jim, was say he ran into Senator Jones and said hello to him. Is there anything wrong with that? It's, I don't, whatever you say, Paul. I'm just saying thank you I would you say for hello my, to him, too. I would say, you know, you I, I mean, I'm friends with uh, the other you senator, too. Me back because you know where the radio gold comes from, and I, I think that's a wise decision. Otherwise, you know what I've been thinking about you? What? I think you've been – I've been thinking it's like you've been mad at your show – by the way you've acted lately. I mean, seriously, Paul, you're not helping your show by doing some of these things. Jim, I need to hear more about this. All right, we'll uh, have that closed-door meeting right, we're going to have, right? So Jim, I, uh, Jim, I need to talk to you soon. Things are happening. Get with me and my people. We'll I mean, get I can't, with you. Jim, I can't wait till like, four months to can't. get an appointment. You really to... can't. I'm glad you're wake, waking it up to that. No, I mean, uh, time is of the essence. Yeah, everything's going out. The Wendell, Wendell, window. Wendell, Wendell. Uh, window. <laughs> Help me, Paul. Window. Windale. What is it, Mark? Winder. Winder. Yeah, help me with. And let me be as app- let me be as sharp as those two clowns in the background. Jim, I want to be. I, I yearn to be that Jim, sharp, Paul. You don't need to name call them. I mean, they're just two guys. No, they don't name call to... me, do they? But Jim, you're a star. They're just two. I know. Two guys. And they got no chance of being that because they don't have the capability. They don't have the ability, and they don't have the gravitas. See you, Paul. No, they don't. Mark and John, uh, you obviously have been told your place. I would have been a Hall of Famer, Paul. But I didn't put my hand through the window. That was a mic drop in case anybody was wondering. Uh, let's continue. How about Paul in Indiana? Let's get back home in Indiana right now. How are you, Paul? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Excellent. Thank you. Well, uh, I think uh, Jim and uh, Daniel earlier in the uh, – show made uh, quite asses of themselves and I think that uh, well Jim did a better job you do so I I, I think they uh, pretty much uh, were just uh, asses who, who was who was that again now you talking about the two guys that we just talked to no, no, no. I was talking about the guy that was just on there. Oh, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, he he was quite an ass. Okay. We, we've established that. <laughs> but uh, I think you're over anyway. your, uh, your limit on, on how many times you can say that word. <laughs> okay. Well, I won't use that word again. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean it's, only, it's only three times an hour we're allowed that uh, by, by, by club rules. Stan is in Arkansas. What do you say, Stan? Well, how you doing there, Mr. Paul? We are doing well. Thank you. Okay. I just have a couple of things I want to talk about. First one was that Chris, he's talking about uh, Alabama fans and baseball. Hey, that's that's just that's straight up just baseball fans having fun. You're going to find that everywhere you go. Okay. That's part of the game. They're there to have fun. And that, that's part of the game. But I was going to talk about David Basil talking about raising back football, and the first time I can say somebody hit the nail on the coffin. 
And uh, he was talking about it. it. It's a shame to say that the, the best things we got going in football coming in is our running back and our secondary. We don't have an offensive line, and we, and we don't have a defensive line. And our starting quarterback is uh, going to be uh, Connor coming in next year as a true freshman, I believe, would be our starting quarterback. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, you know, I, I haven't seen much of these guys, but, but I, I think um, the new offense is going to be pretty exciting to watch. So I hope, I hope uh, Morris can find the right guy. Well, and – Mr. Paul, one thing I, I, I was going to talk about baseball. I'm just glad to see that uh, Arkansas's toughest schedule in baseball is out of the way because we already played Kentucky, went played Ole Miss, and played Florida. And we, we swept Auburn this past weekend. And I'm just hoping we can play halfway decent ball, and I think it'll probably be for the championship in baseball. But we'll be between Florida and Arkansas at the SEC when it comes down to it. Thank you very, very much. Good to hear from you. Let's uh, talk to Ed in Georgia. Good afternoon, Ed. Hey, it's Paul. How are you? Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to rebuttal on the fellow that we're talking about, Alabama fans being um, arrogant. Yes. Paul, Paul we, we are not arrogant. We are realistic. <laughs> you know, we try to work for a championship every year. We try to bring – the best players and like everybody else does, you know, what's wrong with that? That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you're going to pay uh, Nick Saban uh, $11 million a year, what do you expect? <laughs> My oh, exactly. God. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, what, if, you, if you pay me $11 million a year, what would you expect from me? Uh, I would expect success. Well, that's what I would probably give you. You know, I appreciate, uh, I saw the Saban with Trump today, and do you think that uh, Saban would probably make a nice vice president in 2020? <laughs> I think he would make, you know, I, I, I tell you what, I, I was in Saban's office uh, about a year and a half ago, and I asked him about running for office, and he I'm just did not you. want any part of it. But I think the guy would be a great politician. He's very savvy. He's very diplomatic. Ed, thanks very much for the call. I do appreciate it. Great to hear from you. How about Justin in Cleveland? You're on the air. Go right ahead. Paul, I'm here to take up for Jim in Tuscaloosa. I think he pronounces the word window correctly. I think it was Melissa Etheridge who said it best. Come to my window. I'll be home she soon. She did. She sure did. Great song. Love it. Keep it up. Thank you very much. Great to hear from you. Greg is on the phone. Greg, what's up? Hey, Paul. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you. Yeah, a lot going on today. It was nice seeing uh, tr- uh, Trump and the Crimson Tide there together. I know it's uh, their fifth time there, but Trump's first, and hopefully they'll have another opportunity maybe in the future to get there. But I, when I heard that uh, Saban was calling recruits, I could imagine Will Ferrell sitting up there uh, calling some of uh, Kirby's recruits from Georgia using his President George Bush voice or also <laughs> his Ricky Bobby voice. Talking about, you know, coming in second place as being first loser. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so I just thought that was kind of funny when they, when your uh, reporter there had that remark that Nick was uh, calling on the job while I was in the you White know, House. Uh, for, uh, for what happened today, that will be the one takeaway is Nick Saban calling recruits from the Oval Office, whether he was actually doing it or not in the Oval Office. That's that's what people are going to be talking about. Right. And even as Trump was leaving to go handle what's going to happen here shortly in Syria, uh, it was nice to be able to see him take a moment out to enjoy one of America's pastimes. May I, may I ask you a question um, about Jim? Because I've never met Jim. But have you ever fix, uh, physically met Jim from Tuscaloosa? I have not. Um, I have had uh, phone conversations with him, but uh, we have never come face to face. Okay, so other than phone conversations, we don't have any physical proof that he's actually a real person, correct? Well, people have sent us what uh, are believed to be pictures of Jim. I, I, right. was, I was in Tuscaloosa about a year ago at a, a restaurant. And the, the uh, owner told me that Jim had been in there 
previously a couple of days earlier. So I mean, I've had people tell me they think they know who Jim is, but no, we have not had uh, absolute confirmation of Jim. So if if Jim is who he says he is, and he takes credit for all that he said he's done, and, and I don't know Jim other than the last couple of years on this show, I don't understand why he would not take the opportunity uh, to meet you, especially if he's called you since your radio days in Birmingham. I don't know what the hesitancy would yeah, be. Yeah, you know, listen, I, I, I have invited him. Many years ago, we had a uh, Christmas luncheon. Uh, I personally invited him. Uh, he chose not to come up. He, uh, we, we, had, uh, we're in, we were in Huntsville uh, once or twice having a – we used to have an annual uh, spring uh, fall kickoff up there. We invited him with other people. But Jim is uh, – I don't want to call him a recluse. That would mean that he never goes out because he does go out. You, I mean, you hear him give us the Tuscaloosa traffic report every afternoon. <laughs> True. Well, then he at least serves one purpose in life. Have a great day, Paul, and thanks for taking my call. Thank you very much. Great to hear from you, uh, Greg. With quick break, Barrett Lee in the final hour. We'll get his take on Saban at the White House calling recruits and the Ole Miss conundrum. More to come. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. And we welcome all of you back. Glad you're here. It's been a busy show. If you're just getting off work, getting home, uh, we had live coverage in our first hour from the White House. Not often we do that. President uh, welcoming the Crimson Tide in Nick Saban. Then we had uh, some uh, reports from there as well. More of your phone calls at 855-242-7285. Maxine is calling next. Good afternoon, Maxine. Uh, hello, Paul. Hi there. I, I was going to say two things. First, that other caller asked what I've been wanting to ask you. Uh, had you ever saw uh, Jim from Tuscaloosa? Yeah, uh, never. You know, when, you know, when the caller asked you, had you ever saw Jim before? I have and never, I have never uh, seen him, Okay, though. Okay, I had been wanting to ask you that. Uh, I was going to say, uh, sometimes when I listen to him, uh, your secu- if you have security, <laughs> they need to know what he looks like. I'm sorry. Well, you, you, let, let me say this. Uh, he sounds crazy several, sometimes. Several people have sent me what they think is Jim. Um, I don't know whether that's Jim or not, so I don't think it's fair to show someone on the screen. No, I wouldn't want you to do that. I'm talking about you yourself. But, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, would, uh, I would like to meet him. Uh, he, it's. Uh, I mean, I feel like I'm – trying to find jd salinger i mean i just have never i can't i ever i can't seem to land him i mean like i said i said if you have security i need to know what he looks like i'm serious <laughs> no no i think we all would uh, and i wish jim would 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 agree i mean we've invited him to the studio we offered to send a plane for him i heard you i heard you talk about it. oh and another thing i'd like to say is if you ever ever get to win another championship, I would hope that they would go to the White House, no matter who was president. You know what I'm saying? You know how a lot of people refuse, you know, because that the presidential office to me. Yeah, you know, and I I have to give uh, Saban credit today. Uh, He chose not to politicize this visit. Uh, I've heard Saban say this in the past. He respects the office. He, I think he was very generic in what he said because uh, he understands. I mean, listen, every president is, is a polarizing figure. Uh, there are mm-hmm. people that like the president and people that don't. And um, I'm I, old I, enough to know. I've been, I've been every, I'll, every I'll, woman. I'll, but I'll tell you. If, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I, I, I will I, tell you this story, though, uh, Maxine. Uh, I had the occasion um, about five or six years ago to be at the White House in the West Wing and uh, as you – again, I don't mean to uh, – I'm trying to d- describe. As you come out of the Oval Office down a long hallway, uh, you'll take a right, and then you, you'll, it takes you into the Rose Garden. And there was a picture. It was the last picture before you got to the Rose Garden. And the picture was of President Obama and of Nick Saban. I, I, I think it was at one of the uh, either 11 or 12, whatever year uh, they were there, both years, obviously. And I happened to see uh, Saban 
a couple of months later, uh, a couple of weeks later, it wasn't that long, and I said, by the way, I, happen, I mean, I know this sounded a little bit self-serving here. I, said, I happened to be at the White House the other day, <laughs> and, I was, uh, uh, and I saw your picture up. And he actually broke into one of the, one of the three or four times in, in my life I've ever seen him break into a wide grin. Uh, he got a big kick out of the fact that his picture uh, was up. I, they, they rotate the pictures in and out, or they, they did under President Obama. I don't know what they uh, do now under uh, uh, Mr. Trump. But, uh, but it's, uh, it, it doesn't matter who the president is. Uh, That's the way I, I think, feel. I, I think you should go. I, I think that, you know, the office for the president should – nobody says. I totally agree with and, you. And, uh, and, 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 and listen, I, I, professional teams, college teams, they're all welcome to uh, to – Say whatever they want, uh, but you're not there because of the individual. You're there because of the office. Yeah, I think politics and the sports and everything is it should be. You know, that that's just a separate thing. And like I said, if I had a chance to go, I don't care who was president. No, I agree. It doesn't matter to me. I would me. love to go. I would love to go. Cause I love his history and everything. And I just think I would love to go. There is uh, so. there is nothing quite like it. I've had the the uh, the honor of being there a couple of times, uh, especially in the last few years, Maxine. It, it, I I was in there a couple of years, maybe two years ago. Walked in that place, and there is just nothing like it. Uh, and I haven't. It's not like I've been to. Uh, inside Buckingham Palace, I've been outside Buckingham Palace. I have, uh, maybe the Vatican. Uh, certainly, the Vatican would probably top uh, anything I, I will have ever seen uh, walking in there. But uh, okay, uh, Jim wants to explain why he has never, why he will not come on this show and be seen in public. What's the answer, Jim? Well, first, let me respond to Max there, Maxine. Maxine, what business were you in before you got in mind? Ooh. Okay, Paul. I'm, I'm going to go. With, I'm going to tell you exactly what I've told you two or three times since I've been on your show. Okay. From the from day one, I tell you the putrid eye monkey bashed me, and I knew, I knew all those kind of people. Ninety percent of the people at, at those functions were people that hated me, and I didn't like them. I promise you. The only person I miss not being with, and we talked about it many times, was Shane. You know that. I miss not being with Shane. Other than that, I don't want to get around. I don't associate with trash. And I promise you, most of those people at your functions, including Greg, are trash, in my opinion, because they are they're, they're wannabe haters. I mean, they're haters, and they they. But, Jim, they but, but wouldn't, like, wouldn't you put some of this to bed uh, if you? Uh... I don't have to put anything to bed, Paul. I'm not. You think I need to come up there? I don't need to prove anything to you. Or any of the of the people that you, well, are you no, to you don't I, need to prove anything, Jim. But it, it, at least you would be showing, hey, I, this is me. I'm Jim from Tuscaloosa. I, don't, I mean, you say, I, I'm you here every day. I, I mean, what's you, that? you know who I am on the radio. You wouldn't. Have, you don't have to. You don't compliment nine people by telling them what you told about me in the book. I mean, uh, look, Paul. I told you just that. Simple as that. I don't want to be around those people, and I'm afraid if I was around them, something might happen. Either way, something I, might I'm happen. What do you mean, something might happen? Well, I mean, I, if one of them took a shot at me with a, with a fist, he get. I'm like Trump, man. I come back. Jim, I, I promise you, we uh, you, you will have security. No, you can't promise me anything because you, you don't know. Uh, Jim, you, you Jim, show, Jim, Paul. you you will. If you're in on our show, you will be protected. No one will get at you. I don't want to be protected. I don't want to be, and I don't want to be around buffoon liars like I Monkey Squirrel on and on Maxine Greg from wherever he is. I mean, by the way, Jim, you know, I'm Jim, I mean, is, is there something about wait, people that finish, you don't please. like? Let me finish, please. No, well, I is mean, that Greg? Is... Wait, is that Greg guy? You think we wonder if he's real? I mean, if he's real and he was in the submarine Navy. Uh, Jim, uh, uh, Jim, I met Greg last year in Birmingham at SEC Media Days. He is real. Yeah, well, I know what he, he's really a jerk. What he really is? No, no, he's not a jerk. He served this country. No, he is a jerk, Paul. But the way he trashes me on the show. I, I, that's all I go for. That's, I told you the truth. That's all I got for you on that. Thank you. Jim, I'm trying to help you. Can't help you. I don't know where to go after that. William is up next in Kentucky. What do you say, William? Hey, Paul. Hey, I'm about sick of Jim and Daryl. You know, all they want to do is call and bellyache. You know, you can tell by just listening to them on the phone that your mama had to tie a pork chop around her neck and get the dogs to play with him. Mm -hmm. You know, he's at, all they were in high school was probably uh, managers. They carried the water for the players and the sweat rags. 
you know, and then he wants to get on here and then talk, cut people down like Maxine and everybody else. And John, you was right. Par is an average on a, what an average golfer should shoot on the golf course. The better you are, the lower your score is. The worse you are, the higher the score. You know, this show is a great show, but damn if I don't get tired of listening to the belly aching from them two. That's all I got to say, Paul. SRO. We'll take a break. 90 minutes left in case you thought it was almost over. We are coming right back. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. You're not worth a kill. I'm a one-trick pony, literally. I show up at kids' parties and act cute. That's pretty much it. So excuse me for being bitter when Geico says not only could we save you money on car insurance, but we do more, like give you 24-7 access online, over the phone, or even via our award-winning mobile app. Well, ooh la la, aren't they multi-talented? <laughs> hey, I said organic carrots. <laughs> Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. Welcome back. Uh, glad you are here. Let's continue with more phone calls. Art is on the air in Birmingham. Hello, Art. Hello, Paul. Holy cow. I just want to thank you for having such maintained a, a solid show all these years. And, man, you've been bathing all kinds of animals. And I just appreciate it more than anything. You, you well, know, thank you. You go out to the, to the junkyard dogs. And again, I just want to thank you. You do you do great. I, I'm so glad that you've gone on and on like this. Just you know, and, and I want to just tell you again, Bama's got bathed by the rain, and they they're eating the greens and cornbread today. So I just really appreciate it, buddy, man. I'm serious. It's been a long time, and you've been bathing animals of all sorts. I like to bathe animals. <laughs> well, <laughs> not not well. It's better than wiping a butt or a winder, and. Uh, I don't like wiping anything, but uh, hey, I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I, you know, a lot of people get going in the cleaners these days, and, and you take them there. So hey, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you. John is in St. Louis. Hello, John. Paul, how are you doing today? We are doing well. Thank you, John. Uh, Paul, real quick here, just for a couple minutes. You know, I know all the folks want to. I uh, start talking about the uh, the f- SEC football, obviously, with all the spring games coming up. But sure. I wanted to uh, kind of touch on the fact that I think uh, SEC basketball fans have a lot to uh, uh, look forward to coming up. I-, I just think the SEC is continuing to add good coaches. I think the uh, the Georgia hire was a very strong hire. It's not not going to make that program anything but better and better. And I. Uh, don't know a lot about the the coach that was hired. Was it at Mississippi State or Old Miss that was hired from East Tennessee? Uh, but that seemed to be a pretty good hire too. So I think the uh, the SEC is uh, definitely uh, you know starting to build itself to be you know. Yeah, right I mean here, you're talking right, about right. Like Kermit Davis. Uh, he yeah. I think I think that is a really good hire. Uh, he's done a phenomenal yeah. job. At Middle right. Tennessee and uh, Tom Crean. I mean, these are two strong hires. Absolutely. So I really don't see a quote unquote weak link with any uh, of the schools in developing and recruiting kids in the SEC. So I just a general comment. I think, uh, you know, we have a lot to look forward to with uh, a really competitive league. The only thing you look, worry a little bit about is we kind of beat up on each other through the year and then. Seems like we get in that tournament and we come up a little bit short, not being able to get that elite eight or even the final four. So anyway, that's about all I had for today. Okay, appreciate the call, Barrett Salee. A little bit later on, David is next up in Florida. David, welcome. Hey, Paul. I just wanted to say, hey, it's good to get finally get through. Thank um, you. What do you who do you think will be Alabama's starting quarterback? Well, I think too. Uh, I think Jalen Hurts will come out of spring as the starter. Um, it's a little bit difficult to gauge because Tua has been hurt because he hurt himself in the very first practice. So, I mean, I, I, yeah. I can't get a real good handle on it. Yeah, I, saw, I heard that. I was just trying to figure out when uh, their spring game was, but I uh, the spring game will be uh, a week from Saturday, the twenty first. Yeah, and all. Yeah, and also, uh, do you think we'll be able to repeat, or do you think it's going to be some other? 
SEC team this year for Kansas. Well, I mean, listen, you, you you can make a lot of money picking Alabama to win every year. Um, <laughs> That's true. So, uh, they, uh, they, you know, they only repeated one time. That was uh, in 12, but uh, they've been close every other time. So, yeah, I mean, I would uh, I would go with Alabama. All right, thank you. And also, uh, you need to get uh, Laura back on the show. We're trying. Uh, she changed her number, said, do not bother me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and tell John to get off my grass. Thank you very much. Great to hear from you. Larry, uh, always great to hear from Larry. Larry's never told anyone to get off his lawn. No. They told me, but you, you know what I told them, boys? Hey, stand down, boys. Stand down. Hey, hey Larry, uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking that you know, if Alabama wins it again, will you go to the White House? I'll, I'll take you to the Would you like to go to the White House next year? Oh, man. People downplay that. that Can you imagine a, uh, walking into the wow. Oval Office and say, uh, President Trump, this is, he said, Larry from, Larry from Shelby, the fine bomb show, right? Woo! Yes, he watches, sir. he watches, I guarantee he's, he's got it on right now. You dang right. No, Trump knows when I do the BL sign. Hey, me and you, little BL Jack, I guarantee you drink one with me. He's a BL man. But I, that would be amazing, boy. I mean, I want to do, you know, two things in my life I would love to do, Paul. Right now, I know I'm short of time. But I would love to beat the snot out of them two uh, Yankee Doodle butt wipers there you got. And, uh, uh, God, ho- ho- hold on a second, okay? Mm-hmm. Hold on just one second there. Uh, I'd like to get Mark and John on our screen here for a second. And Can I just rerun yeah. yesterday's show uh, Larry, or Monday's show Larry, on, or guys. Thursday's show? Larry, repeat what you just said. First, Number one thing you'd like to do. I'd like to beat the it's snot big, out of them big, two Yankees big, in there. Snot out of Big Ten, John and Mark, them butt, Yankee butt whoppers. Larry, you I really know? don't appreciate your aggression. I thought we were friends. That's what, that means I'm hitting home. That means I'm doing good, Jack. Oh, man, show me some fire, baby. Fire. Show me something. Woo, get mad, Jack. Get I'm not home. ready to be mad today, Larry. I'm trying to come to a truce with you. You're a funny guy. We like your calls. Used to like his calls. Okay. Used to. Now, Larry, okay. uh, Larry uh, hold what? on a second, Larry. I just had a curiosity. Is... I mean, there's all kinds of variations of beating whatever. Uh, beating the snot out. Is that just like what? Just, just beating the snot out. You know, <laughs> when the snot runs out their nose, you know. So as soon as the snot starts running out, that is that like that's tapping out of the thing. fight? Uh, that's a tapping out. You don't and need to do know, anything more once the snot starts appearing. That's right. And Big Ten John challenged me on his phone to that golf tournament that he's been promising me. And the one thing that would make me happy, and I would treat them like gold, if they could get me and Rich on the golf course and beat us like we've been getting promised. And I want it. And I I'm, should be. And, and Big Ten John, you all be ashamed of yourself. Some poor old man like me. What's something happening to me tomorrow? Larry, golf well, is a gentleman's game, Larry. Well, you, you This kind of talk is me? not appreciated. At the Fine Bomb Country Club. Okay, I will tone down if you'll play me. If you'll play me and Rich at his golf course, and we if we lose, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll say anything. I'll, I'll wear anything. I'll sing songs. Uh, Larry, I, I don't wake up in the morning thinking about what you're going to wear in the <laughs> afternoon, okay? That's the last Larry. thing on my mind. Come on, man. You promised. You said you'd play us. Are you teasing me? Is that what you're doing? Pick a good golf course, make it tea time, and we'll be there, Larry. It's not that difficult. I, I'm going to be nicer from now on. I ain't going to be so mean. Be a gentleman, but, but Larry. I, I know you've got it deep course. inside you, brother. Be a gentleman. But, but I am, man. we get on that golf course, you're going to see the gentleman. That's what they call me, <laughs> gentleman. Okay. Got it, Jack. Jack, roll tide. Roll tide, roll tide, roll tide. Well, we're going to take a break here and uh, get this show. Well, we're not going to get it back on track, but we are going to come back after this message. What, 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 what
You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. We welcome you back. If you missed some of the conversation, well, not the conversation, but the events at the White House, we'll try to uh, recap uh, some of the highlights from the White House earlier today. For those of you just getting uh, on board, let's uh, talk to Marianne in Pittsburgh. Uh, how are you, Marianne? I'm fine, Paul. How are you? Excellent. Thank you very much. First time caller, long time listener. Um, the point of my call is for the gentleman in the booth, if they want the perfect song to describe um, Jim from Tuscaloosa, it's Glory Days by Bruce Stingsing. Oh, what a great song. Well, if you watch the video, it's like it was made for Jim. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much about a guy who, well, I think, walks into a uh, place uh, that he used to hang out and starts reliving with a guy, a buddy, and starts reliving when they were baseball players in high school, yeah. I think. yeah. But thank you very much. You have a good day. Thank you very much. Anytime you get the boss on the show, we're uh, we're happy. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it very, very much. Robert in North Carolina. Hello, Robert. Hey, Mr. Paul. How you doing? We are doing well. Thank you. Hey, um, don't don't pay any attention to old Gene and Squirrel Man, but um, you got to get running back coming from North Carolina to the Georgia Bulldogs. What do you think about him? going to be a freshman this year i've heard a little bit uh, yeah, i expect him to be really good but you know it's always a, a difficult prediction to make on how good someone will be but but i'm upbeat what about you have you seen him play oh yeah yeah he's uh he's real good just keep as long as he can stay healthy but um if tell jim and squirrel man if they want to see some good baseball players come to uh, uh north carolina and click we show them what how to play baseball now, where is Clinton in North Carolina? 60 miles from Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay. Uh, where Jim Valvana coached at. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, no, no, not well. too far from uh, a buddy from uh, Tower Hill. So, uh, Tower Hill country and Wolfpack country. So, okay. Um, I, I got it now. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm new to North Carolina. I'm still trying to figure out which, which direction is which. <laughs> anyway, love your show and um, you keep up the good work. And don't worry about Squirrel Man and Big Jim because. Bring him up here. We'll show him how to play um, baseball. We'll go squirrel hunting with squirrel, man. I got a squirrel dog. I bet you do. Robert, thanks for the call from uh, the Tar Heel State. Steven is in, Steve is in Tennessee, the volunteer state. How are you, Steve? I'm great. How are you, Paul? Excellent. Thank you very much for calling. I just wanted to call and say I'm a born and raised Memphian. All right. Uh, I don't know where you went to school. I went to Messick. Graduated in '65. Not ashamed of that uh, town. It, it's like all big towns. It's good and bad. No, I mean I was a few uh, years behind you. I, went, I, I graduated at uh, White Station, uh, but uh, it was a uh, yeah, Memphis was a fascinating city to grow up in. I'm, I, I, I'm sad that I haven't spent much time there uh, since I, I left. Uh, but well, uh, but I've been back a few times uh, occasionally, and it's, it's it's quite a different city. Yes, it is. Uh, I grew up in the good times and um, also the bad times there. I moved to Olive Branch, Mississippi. Yeah, sure, right uh, below. Uh, yeah, also uh, uh, outside of the Tennessee River over here at Sardis, Tennessee. Oh, sure. In West Tennessee. I just want to say uh, University of Memphis is my home team. And, um, of course, it was back in Memphis State before I went to Vietnam. But uh, And uh, I just want to say that uh, Arkansas won't come back across the river. <laughs> Alabama's never beat us, and Auburn's only beat us once, and that was in a bowl game a couple of years ago. You know, I was at that uh, game. It was, what, uh, late 80s, I remember. Uh, I was at the Liberty Bowl when, when Memphis beat Alabama. It was, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. And I got to ride in the car. I was with the police department. I got to ride in the car with Bear Bryant. Did you really? Yep, sure did. Was that for his final game? I rode with him on the night he played Illinois. That was yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I was uh, a young reporter uh, in that uh, stadium that night. That was I'll never forget that night as long as I live. It was frozen. Yeah, it was was unbelievably cold. Yeah, I uh, I was so smart I didn't even wear a uh, coat and. Yeah, oh, that was that was smart. Paul. Yeah, well, I was but, uh, not quite as smart back then as I am now. <laughs> exactly. I, I, today, I would have worn a coat. But what I like to say is, Drew 
probably has more IQ than some of the people you talk to, to half the night. Uh, Drew up there in uh, New Jersey. He seems to know his uh, game, and the rest of them just... That's the reason they don't call in, because I don't want Squirrel and Jack and Jim jumping on me, because there is no one specific team that I pull for. I do pull for the SEC when it comes to every other team besides Memphis, and I just don't want to get between them. Because well, you know what, uh, think- Steve, we have a lot in common. Uh, well, not, I mean, I didn't go to Vietnam, but we, I did grow up in Memphis pulling for the Tigers, so uh, we have that uh, together, but... Uh, I appreciate you calling. You brought back some uh, some great memories of. Uh, of well, yesterday. I married a girl. I married a girl in '68 from Central. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, they're trying to have a 51st anniversary here wow. coming up. So I you're have, always. Uh, I, I've never been back to a reunion. I, I don't know if anybody's still alive, but I, I'm thinking about going one of these days. Oh, there's more people alive than you think. <laughs> probably. I'm glad to hear, uh, Steve. Thank hey, you very you're much. Probably and you'll never recognize them. <laughs> you bet. Great to hear from you. We'll take a break. Another hour to go. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Put a little carry on the car. It was BYOG, bring your own guts. This is the best, the best. Do you hear me? Of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Welcome back. We've had a good show. Uh, certainly a lot of conversation about the uh, White House visit by Alabama. We'll get into some other issues, some other stories. Barrett Salee joining us. Always great to uh, talk to Barrett. Barrett, thanks for the time. Uh, let me get, uh, first of all, your your reaction to Alabama at the White House. Certainly, uh, it's, it's always a good recruiting tool, especially when Nick Saban calls recruits from the White House. You can't let a great opportunity go to waste. And, uh, and calling recruits from the White House, I'm sure, will be uh, – something that gets their attention. And I thought it was interesting in, in the little speech that, that the minor speech that they gave that uh, the Donald Trump said that Nick Saban had never been in the Oval Office during any of his trips, uh, previous trips we're, there. We're, so, we're fact-checking him on that. I was going to say, like, I, I, if I was Nick Saban or if anybody, like, if I was any of those guys, I'd like, that'd be the first request that I have, go to the Oval Office. But if he did go to the Oval Office, I want to know if he called a recruit, and I want to know which recruit he called, because uh, that is one heck of a recruiting yeah, I mean, we, we suspect it would be from a, a deep red state, but uh, that would be pretty much the entire SEC, wouldn't it? Right, and uh, I, I would suggest maybe FaceTiming, but definitely don't use Facebook Live based on other no, things that are happening Facebook in Washington, Live was, today. No, was all booked up today. <laughs> right, I think they were uh, tied up somewhere else. Well, let's let's get that. Uh, we put a bow on that. Let me let me get you to one of the other interesting stories of the day, and, and that's the Shea Patterson conundrum uh, he wants to go to Michigan uh, a couple of things are happening still don't know clarity on the Ole Miss appeal and now Ole Miss uh, is doing what exactly are they doing uh, Barrett well they're not really doing anything I, you know I think this is you know Ole Miss doesn't have any say whether Shea Patterson's eligible or not they can you know give him a blessing or in in fact in what they did um, say they disagree with his appeal for a waiver to be eligible immediately but in reality, it, they're not doing anything. Like Nothing that Ole Miss says is going to sway the NCAA one way or the other. Uh, so really, I think all they're doing is, is trying to uh, prevent this from, from happening with, with other school uh, players that go to Ole Miss or go, you know, go to other schools or whatever. And, and I think they, I think they want to stay faith a little bit. And um, I, I don't necessarily know if that's working. If I were Ole Miss, I would back off because I don't think it's working. And, Full disclosure, I think if, if a school goes under NCAA investigation, those players should be able to transfer and play immediately regardless of their classification, regardless if they're going to miss out on a bowl game. But rules are rules, and I think Ole Miss is looking at this saying, Shea Patterson was recruited with a bunch of other guys with the knowledge that the investigation was happening. And at that time, remember it was you know 8 of 11 were, were football uh, related uh, allegations, but none of them were overly overly serious. None of them were overly crippling at that time. And the, the second notice of allegations is the one that really brought down Ole Miss. And that didn't exist yet. And I think Ole Miss is looking at this saying, would, would this even be considered? Would a waiver even be considered had the hammer not come down? And the answer, I think, is no. 
I think anybody can look at that and say, no, it probably would not even be considered. And, and I think that they feel like they're being used, in a sense, by players who just wanted to get out, um, despite the fact that, you know, they, they kind of knew what this all was going in. I mean, Shea Patterson's brother was on staff. He did enroll early, so, you know, he was already on campus when that, out, that notice of allegation was, uh, the first one was, was released. But, I mean, it, it's not like that's the one that brought down Ole Miss. I, I think um, they, they kind of feel like they're being used a little bit. So it's, it's a complicated situation, and I understand why they're doing it. I don't think it's really the right course of action. Uh, but, um, you know, it, I, I understand what, where they're coming from. Barrett Slee with us. Uh, Barrett, we are moving our, or mowing our way through all the spring games in the SEC. We're heading toward, I think, the third weekend of it. Let's, before we get to this weekend, what, what, any takeaways from the previous two weeks, South Carolina the first week and then a couple of games, including Auburn, last Saturday? Yeah, I think South Carolina is – the clear-cut number two team in the SEC East. I love that offense. I, I think you didn't get to see a full version of it because of, of several guys recovering from injury, including Debo Samuel. Um, I, I, I'm really excited to see what South Carolina does, um, you know, defensively uh, when they get healthy on that side of the ball too. Because I, I do trust that staff, T. Rob and and, uh, and Will Mustang have done a good job. Uh, I, I really like what I saw from South Carolina. I I did like what I saw from from Arkansas too, at least offensively. Because there, it looked like Ty Story and, and Cole Kelly were pretty comfortable in the passing concepts that, that they were being asked to, to do in the spring game. They weren't comfortable with the tempo. And, but, I mean, 15 practices in, what do you expect? But I do think that Arkansas's defense is still a massive liability. And Auburn, I mean, everybody was banged up. You couldn't really tell an awful lot. Uh, I, I do think the one thing that sort of stood out to me is, is that front seven is filthy. I mean, I, I think even without Jeff Holland, they're going to be better in the front seven la- uh, this year than they were last year um, because, I mean, you look at the versatility on the defensive line alone, I mean, it's pretty astounding. Talking to Barrett Shelley, let's take a look uh, ahead to this weekend and obviously the final weekend. We'll see Alabama, mm-hmm. Tennessee, among others. Uh, what are you looking, for, looking forward to this weekend? We have Kentucky. On Friday night, uh, A&M, who else? Uh, uh, Florida. Florida. And there's one more Saturday. Mizzou. Course, yeah, Missouri. Um, yeah, I think the, the two that really stand out to me are, are Florida and Texas A&M. For Florida, I mean, everyone wants to talk about the quarterbacks, and, and I get it. I mean, Felipe Frank is the experienced guy that, that obviously a lot of coaches, especially first-year head coaches, always want to err on the side of experience. But it seems like everybody's been talking about Kyle Trask and – He's a guy who hadn't played a lot of football at any level, you know. So when he, even when in high school he didn't play a ton of uh, football. So um, I want to see what the buzz is about with Kyle Trask um, because maybe he unseats Felipe Franks as the the, the safer option uh, ahead of Emory Jones. I think everybody knows that Emory Jones is the guy who fits Dan Mullen's system. But Kyle Trask, I think, is in this thing a little bit more than – than maybe expected. And at Texas A&M, I know everyone's going to focus on quarterbacks, and I get it. Nick Starkle and Kellen Mond are both good players. I just want to know what Texas A&M's offensive identity is because Jimbo kind of got stuck at times, um, maybe putting a little too much trust in quarterbacks when he was at Florida State uh, and, and maybe got into a mode where he was run, 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 throw it 60 yards and pray. And, and really, you look at what Texas A&M is built for and the offensive coordinator, Yair and Daryl Dickey, who ran a, a pretty – uh, West Coast style short pass offense at Memphis, that actually fits what Texas A and M is supposed to be in terms of its personnel better than what Jimbo ran in Tallahassee. So uh, I want to see what the offense looks like. I want to see if Jimbo Fisher has changed himself and left his ego in Tallahassee and, and built an offense around players that um, that that are supposed to do what 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 Texas high school players and really what Dickey did at, at Memphis. Um, you know, do best. So I think that's the more important question. The quarterback situation will settle itself because both of those guys can play. Uh, Barry, every time we've talked to you over the last three years, we ask you about LSU, and sometimes your comments go over well and sometimes not. And the reason I bring this up now is the (laughs) FPI came out the other day. I'm sure you saw it. It gives uh, LSU uh, the odds of coming in in the middle of the pack uh, pretty high. uh, they're, They're struggling to find seven wins for this program. I think the last time you... We're here. You felt better about LSU. 
Well, I mean, if they get six or seven wins, everybody's getting fired. Uh, so, okay. um, you know, I, I think they um, – you know, look, I, I think LSU is in a tough spot. I, I, I think that Ed Orgeron is in the mode of putting all the shifts in the center of the table. If it works out and they've got a good defense, then, and, and if the offense just comes through a little bit, um, he'll be fine. But if it, if it fails, it's going to fail in dramatic fashion. And, um, you know, I, I think for LSU, the, the biggest question is this. It's not so much the quarterback, although that's obviously a point of concern. They lose like 90 – it's like uh, somewhere around 94% of their rushing productivity from last year. It, it's one thing to have constant quarterback issues at LSU and, and have a decent defense that, that sort of rules the day. But if you have running back issues too, and we'll see what happens with Brissett and that crew, then then that's ma- a, a massive problem. So I think they've got issues. I, I think this year is going to be um, you know a make or break year, and it's either going to make Ed Orgeron the most beloved coach in LSU history, or usher in a new era that hopefully, for our sake, includes Lane Kiffin and Baton Rouge. <laughs> Before you go, anything? If you're uh, are you hearing anything out of Tuscaloosa on the quarterback battle? No, I mean, I think that the biggest thing for me with that is is what happens with Jalen Hurts and, and has he separated himself because of Tua's injury? Because he was basically handed a golden opportunity to say, hey, look, yeah, you were the, the, the maybe the, the under, uh, the, the, not the front runner going in, but uh, you had this opportunity now to basically work with the ones the whole time, at least for the first few practices. Uh, how far ahead did you get? And if the answer is not very far, then he's not going to win the job. And so... Um, you know, Nick Saban said last week that, you know, kind of joked that he doesn't have a timetable and asked the media if, you know, we have a timetable. But the truth of the matter is the players set the timetable. Jalen Hurts has a timetable. Tua Tagovailoa has a timetable. And by the end of spring practice, those guys are going to know, you know, who's getting the majority of the ones, who's getting the majority of the twos. And they're going to want – both of those guys are going to talk to Nick Saban after, after spring practice in his office and have very legitimate questions that ultimately sets the timetable for Nick Saban. So, um, you know, I, I think Jalen is a good player. We've never seen him react or put, been put in a situation like this where he has to react to being the underdog uh, and be pushed, and he was handed a golden opportunity. So, you know, information out of Tuscaloosa is <laughs> very hard to get these days, but uh, those guys will know by the end of spring practice, and that timeline will be set by those players for Nick Saban. Well, call Trump. I'm sure he got the skinny at the in the Oval Office conversation today. You think that's the first thing he asked uh, Saban? Okay, who's it going to be? I just like the fact that he, uh, Donald Trump really, really thought about saying to his full name, and then like said, "No, that we're not even going to bother." <laughs> just said that that will that will end poorly. But no, I mean, you know, I, I I'm I'm glad those guys got to experience it. Looks like they had fun. I mean, anytime you can go to the White House and do all that stuff, that's pretty cool. Barrett Salib. Still waiting for his invitation to the White House. Barrett, <laughs> thank you for being on. Appreciate it, as always. <laughs> I appreciate it. I don't want that job, though. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Good stuff from Barrett Salee. Uh, and we will take a break. 30 minutes to go. Your phone calls, 855-242-7285. We are coming back. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Welcome back to our program. Let's go right to the calls. Big day for the Crimson Tide, so why not share the the big uh, news with Legend calling us from Alabama. Legend, how are you? Just getting back from the White House, Paul. Man, uh, what the, <laughs> what 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 the what the, what the Trumpster have to say? Well, he took me and Nick in the Oval Office and got some advice on some of the national affairs, and uh, I let him kiss the ring before I left the office. You know, so. But uh, hey, Paul, uh, on a serious note. You know, I just got off the legend phone with Butch Jones, and uh, we're going to give Auburn a championship of life ring. (laughs) Hey, what did you think of Daniel Carlson saying today that uh, they might be the national champs, but we're the state champs? Well, here's the problem. Here's the thing with Alabama and Auburn. It's always true. Auburn knows this deep down. Alabama are global thinkers, Paul. We're the first team to go to the Rose Bowl. We're the first team that the nation really took serious from the South. We was the first team to kick that door down and tell the whole world that they really play football down here in the South. We're the real team that has dominated the nation for the last 10 years. We're global thinkers, Paul. 
Auburn is farmers. <laughs> Paul, these people are worried if the crops come in this season. I mean, the fact of the matter is the Iron Bowl is their Super Bowl. I mean, if they can win that one game, they will give a coach $50 million, Paul. $50 million for winning the Iron Bowl. I mean, it, it, it's really sad to me because they're not global thinkers. They're just farmers, Paul. They're just farmers. I mean, to them, winning the Iron Bowl is everything. We could care less. I, they could win it every year if there's a ring and a trophy at the end of the season for me. I'm going to get out of it. They can put Sean well, it, 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 it did, uh, Legend, uh, it did cost you three straight national championships in 2013. Well, Paul, I mean, on occasion. I mean, we can't win them all, Paul. I mean, mean, Saban knows. I mean, Saban will tell the folks close to him. He should have seven or eight right now. But but the reality is we can't win them all. At the end of the day, though, you know, Auburn is a mediocre program that on occasion pulls out a a marvelous, fantastic year. That's who Auburn is. At the end of the day, they're a mediocre program that every five years they pull something out of their butt. I mean, that's who they've been. They ain't had a back-to-back 10-win season since 89, Paul. Since 89. Come on. Since 89, this program ain't had a back-to-back 10-win season. I mean, I, I mean, their kickers on crack. Their whole team's yeah, on I, crack. Yeah, and I don't, think, uh, I don't think Saban has beaten an Auburn team uh, that's uh, ever won nine games or more either, has he? Oh, oh, you taking up for Auburn? Is that what this is? I'm just trying to be fair. <laughs> Come on, Paul. Come on, dude. You cannot take up for this program, man. You cannot take up for a program that just gave a coach forty nine million dollars for a nine and four season. I mean, you well, no, I, 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 well, I cannot. Uh, uh, listen, I, I'll tr- I, I cannot take up for them, but I did hire. Gus Malzahn's agent to represent the two of us. <laughs> I need some help, Paul. This radio been the rough. <laughs> I need some help. What's going on there? Anything? Uh, that, something? I mean, are you? Is there, is there some some news you want to share with us? Oh, I got fired, Paul. <laughs> you got, yeah, fired got fired from the radio? I, I got fired, Paul. I got fired. I, I can't say no more about it, Paul. But I, I got fired. It, it was my own fault, though, Paul. It was my own fault, though. You know what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes the suits just don't like the fans, Paul. At the end of the day, you know what I'm saying? When I walk in the room with the media, it's like uh, a pair of brown shoes in a closet with a bunch of tuxedos, Paul. That, that's the way they look. Well, I want you to know, Legend, I am sorry to hear that. I, I was, as you know, uh, Danny Sheridan and I were big supporters of your radio career. I, some other people here weren't, but I was. Well, I know, Paul, and I appreciate it. You know, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a fan. I was just having fun. Some people take it too serious. You know, I was just having really fun with it. I know I'm not Paul Feinbaum. I know... I, I was told, Paul, I don't have the degrees, and because of my background, you know, nobody can really say, you know, they're associated with the legend. And I understand that. I ain't stupid, Paul. I, I got a high IQ. I understand that from the business point of view. But at the same time, you know, I preach across the nation. I preached to over nearly a million people, Paul. I've been talking on the radio forever. You don't have to have a degree to talk. You just have to have the ability to have an opinion. Well, you know, you know, Legend, there's people. just some people in this business that, that think they're better than the average person, and, and that that's what you were trying to undo, and I applaud you for that. Well, I appreciate it, Paul. I mean, you've been an inspiration. I would like to be Paul Feinbaum, but I'm not stupid. I ain't never going to be Paul Feinbaum. But you know what I'm saying? I, I still have the right, you know, to chase whatever I want to chase. I love radio. I love broadcast. I love speaking to the people. Because I feel like I have a unique view and a unique point of view because of my background, because of my experiences that Paul Feinbaum or no other person with a degree could even understand in the slightest little bit, Paul. But some people don't have the imagination to see that, and I understand that. But somebody out there, Paul, what do you think? going to say, hell yeah, let's give Legend his own show because he'll blow a lot of shows out of the water. 
Well, you got to be different in this business because most people sound the same. They, 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 most, most radio talk show hosts talk for one reason, to hear the sound of their own voice. Yeah, and here's the thing that made you great, Paul. You gave the fans a voice. You gave the fans a voice, Paul. And that's why people love you. And that's why people hate you in the business. And you know I'm not lying. People hate you in this business oh, yeah. because you associate with legends. You associate with Jim from Tuscaloosa. A lot of people, uh, me and Jim, they've been beneath us. You know, we're beneath them individuals because they see themselves as high polluted individuals. I thank God for people like you, people like Milton McGregor, Joe O'Neill, people that have seen that I, you know, I've been out of prison 20 years, Paul. I don't have to answer to nobody. I did my time. I'm ashamed of what I did, and I paid my price. I shouldn't be punished for something that I'm 20 years out in society and behind and have established myself as an individual that can be trusted in society. You know, I wouldn't hurt a flea. I, I talk trash on the radio, but actually put my hands on somebody, they, they'd have to put their hands on me first. You know, I'm not stupid. But, you know, at the end of the day, I am who I am. And uh, you know what? I come on fine by and talk five minutes every day and talk to millions of people. So, hey. <laughs> I hear you, Hey, Legend, thanks for being honest. We always appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate you, Paul. Love you, dude. And, hey, to the nation, kiss the rings, Albert. Peace out. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll go to break and come back with much more of the program after this. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. You're not worth a kill. Okay, let's go back to the calls, and Squirrel is up next. What do you say, Squirrel? Well, I'll say today's show has been electric. That's what I'll say. I mean, you know, the first three and a half hours was the gym show, and you know I love that. And then Legend drops this bomb on us right here at the end. I mean kind of stunned how about you I mean, well you know listen I, I i i was sorry to see i mean i don't know what the circumstances were i have a feeling I, I do with all the negativity uh that came from this show and others about legend having some fun on the radio what's the big deal the guy uh yeah the guy, the he, he guy, stated the, his price is sad and he's trying i give him credit for we trying. did l- l- listen uh squirrel the whole purpose of of sending people away is to rehabilitate them so they'll be better citizens. And, and the guy's 20 years out of the out of the, sure. uh, the the jail. I mean, it seems like he's done pretty well. Well, look, nobody has more stroke in the business than you. Why don't you help him? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I, what, what, do you, what, what do you think? What do you think? I, what do you think I've been trying to do the last couple of years? Well, well I know you have. And, and, and I, like I said, he and I have fun with each other on Twitter and on here and what have you. But I, but I, I respect that he's trying. I really do. And I respect that he owns up to what he's done, and he's always owned up to it. You know. And uh, I mean, from years well, ago, yeah, the, I, remember well, I mean, listen. Uh, I just think when you admit what you've done and i've had i've had private conversations with him about why he went to jail it's a serious crime oh i and, know, well, uh, I know what he did, yeah. and you got out and listen uh you know people can say whatever they want uh that, that that's with him the rest of his life but at least he's doing something with his life he's got a good and, job and i agree and at least he's not out there committing more crimes so like i said I, I i hope he i hope he eventually makes it and then i can say i knew him back when but, you know, I, I was actually a big supporter of his uh, radio show. I mean, I listened to two okay. out of the three you hours. You told us, yeah. That he was on air, you know. So, uh, you know, and maybe he'll get another shot. But if if you'll look on Twitter, you'll see kind of why he may have gotten in trouble because he's, he's got to learn with some of these big wig program director types, you've got to kind of tone it down a little bit. Uh, in a sense, because well, they do kind of Yeah, I mean, I read well. some of that, and then, you know, the guy, the, guy, the guy that ran the station didn't like it, and that's his prerogative. I mean, he, he runs yeah, the he, station. And, and I that don't. Guy could have, he could have gone about it in a different manner, too. But, uh, but no, it's been a great show, other than, you know, there was a lot of whining from the stars today, I noticed. I mean, first you had Matt come on whining, and then Jim's been kind of whining a little bit today, too. I mean, he says he won't show up at none of your functions because he's worried that somebody's going to punch him. I mean, have you had any fisticuffs break out at any of your? Uh, matter of fact, we had uh, a near fight between 
K Dub near fight. You said well, near well, fight. Uh, I man and K Dub came pretty close to blows uh, about Look, three, about five years ago. Staring each other across. The well, no, I, th- I think there was blows. some uh, hands on each other, but uh, yeah, it was no, pretty. I don't think. Uh, I don't think there was no hands on each other. Not, well, not I mean, uh, right. you know, let's scroll. Tell me what I saw with my own eyes, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. No, that's one function. How many functions you do have? A thousand. Well, not that many, but uh, I mean, five hundred, five hundred. You've had as many. As okay, so as we, been we had a we had a near miss. Anyway, we had a near miss. Let's let's put it that way. Okay, one out of five hundred. The odds are pretty good if you show up at a fine bomb function, you're not going to get punched. Can't we? Uh, I man? would say they're overwhelming. Yes. Yeah. So, Jim, show up, man, and and prove once and for all that you're not a fraud. That's all. That's all we're asking. Thanks for taking my call. Aloha. <sighs> what about it? Well, I didn't call to be negative, but, you know, he, that fool, lying fool, that's what he is. I never said a word about being worried about being punched. I said I was worried I might punch somebody because, they, they, you know, what they say to me off the air like they do, and I didn't want to be associated with trash like that guy who just had on. But I'm going to go to something that you want, I think you want to hear, Paul. That call by legend is why he's, he's better than me now because... He's got an attitude that's right. He's fun, like you said. I, I said that the whole time I heard him talking. He's a fun guy. He, and, and people love the guy. Well, you know what I like about him? And I think you agree. I mean, he lays it all out. He's not trying to be something else. I, but let me say, I'm making my own points, if you will. I, I'm doing pretty good. I don't need much help. I'm telling you, my sister loves him more than she loves me on the air. He's got such a great per- attitude. He lifts people up. With He's a fun guy, even when he's attacking Auburn or something. It's it's in fun, you can tell. I love Legend. He is great. He's the greatest caller on radio right now, in my opinion. Yeah, I got bitter, Paul, about things because of scumbags like he just had on that lie. I can't stand liars. But Legend doesn't let him get let it get to him and he's got a great attitude and yeah, I'll do anything and you we should do anything we can because he's gold on the radio, Paul. I mean he is gold. All all that glitters is gold. Thanks, Jim. Thank you for listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. The Paul Feinbaum Show airs weekdays on the SEC Network, beginning at 3 Eastern.